I am pleased to talk to you on the scientific day of the Faculty of Applied Medical Science at the Libyan International Medical University. The Faculty of Applied Medical Science is an updated version of the Faculty of Basic Medical Science, which was originally established at Limo in the year 2007. This update version was made to meet the requirements of the labor market and the society in order to provide specialized graduates in the fields of basic medical science as well as that of clinical laboratory science. Moreover, one of the important roles of the faculty is to host medical and dental students of LIMO during the preclinical uh, phase of study. Today, I am pleased to announce the commencement of the Faculty Scientific Day for the academic year 2020-2021, which will be online presented through this video. In fact, due to COVID-19, our scientific day for this year will be done differently, where all activities will be carried under the precautionary measures. In accordance to this pandemic, this scientific day will include a talk run by faculty experts to discuss the issue of COVID-19 vaccines and its associated fears. Also, some students will present their findings regarding the commitment of AMS students with the precautionary measures and vaccinations. Moreover, this video, in this video, we will be presenting some of our students' activities that we were carried through all the academic year, where the faculty is adopting a variety of teaching activities in order to provide students with knowledge, transferable skills, and lifelong learning habits. These activities included presentations that discuss global health issues, posters that deals with different scientific topics, as well as lab reports that shows the students' observations and findings after practical sessions. I would like to express my appreciation to the University Council for continuous support. I also would like to thank Applied Medical Science team and AMS students who contributed to this completion of this work. Finally, let us all support that education is not preparation for life, education is the life itself. I wish you all the best and complete success. Thank you.
مرحبا بكم في المسابقة الثقافية تستهدف هذه المسابقة جميع طلاب السنوات الدراسية والهدف منها تحفيز الطلبة على التنافس الثقافي وتنمية القدرة المعرفية وحثهم على البحث وكذلك تعزيز روح التعاون تتكون المسابقة من جولتين وأربعة فرق وكل فريق يحتوي على أربعة أفراد أساسيين وأربعة أفراد للاستعانة ولكل سنة دراسية فرد مساعد من اللجنة تتنافس الفرق الأربعة في الجولة الأولى ويتأهل منها فريقين للمنافسة في الجولة الثانية لعبة اللغز يتم تسليم أعضاء الفريق ظرف به ورقة اللغز مرسوم ومطبوع سؤال الكيس يتم وضع سؤال مع الحل داخل كيس على أن يكون الحل على هيئة أحرف يتم تجميعها لتكوين الحل تهجئة الكلمة يقوم أحد أعضاء اللجنة بنطق ثلاث كلمات وعلى أحد أعضاء الفريق كتابة الكلمة بشكل صحيح على السبورة لعبة البالون يتم فرقعة البالون المختار من قبل أحد أعضاء الفريق ويتم فتح السؤال الموجود داخله وتوجيهه للفريق المنافس على أن يتم حله في وقت معين لعبة السماعات يقوم أحد أعضاء الفريق بارتداء سماعة ومن ثم يقوم الزميل بتجميع جملة على أن تكون الجملة حكمة أو مثل لعبة الإخفاء يتم وضع مجموعة من الأشياء ومن ثم يقوم الطلاب بالركض إلى زملائهم من الفريق لحصر ما تم رؤيته لعبة البحث عن سؤال يتم اختيار ورقة من مجموعة أوراق في الصحن تشير إلى مكانه ثم يحضر السؤال ويجاوب عليه وكل ذلك في وقت محدد يتنافس الفريقين الفائزين من الجولة الأولى والعمل على تجميع أكبر عدد من النقاط التي تؤهلهم للفوز تتكون من عدد من الأسئلة الثقافية للمجموعتين كل مجموعة لها وقت مخصص يعرض على الشاشة أمام الفرق للإجابة على الأسئلة يحتسب عدد النقاط لكل الأسئلة كالآتي في حال تم الإجابة على السؤال بشكل صحيح تسجل النقاط كاملة للفريق في حال الإجابة على السؤال بشكل خاطئ تخصم من الفريق نقاط السؤال بالكامل في حال تمت الإجابة على الأسئلة من خلال الاستعانة بالمساعد تحسب من وقت الإجابة وكذلك تخصم من مجموع النقاط في حال عدم معرفة الإجابة واستخدام كلمة باص بالعدد المسموح به وهو أربع مرات تجمد النقاط أي لا يتم احتساب أي نقطة ولا خصم أي نقطة
تجميع مجموعة قام الأعمى تكوين إيش تكوين كلمة ناقصة بعدين ينص بالصف المثل والحكمة والحروف وإجابة على ورق مطوى اللي هو عندكم اللي هو الأي فور الأول بس وعلى
Hello everyone, my name is Arwa Dries Lalem. Today I will talk about one of the emerging infectious diseases, which is HIV or human immunodeficiency virus. I would like to start with a brief history about HIV. The first of revived case was in 19 was in 1959, was a blood sample taken from a man who was living in what's now Congo. So you, be, you might be wondering about where did HIV come from? In fact, HIV came from certain type of chimpanzees in Central Africa. The chimpanzee version of virus known as SIV or semen immune deficiency virus was probably passed to human when a human hunting these chimpanzees for meat or be the in, in directly contact with their infected blood. Over decades, over decades, HIV spread slowly in Africa and other parts of the world, since we know it's existed in the United States since mid to late 1970s. Since now, we know the history of how HIV. Let's go to the main points of the, my presentation today. What is HIV? Knowing the stages of HIV, HIV and the most interesting part, which is the mode of transmission of HIV, and by knowing the mode of transmission, we can manage and prevent HIV. Starting out with the first objective, what is HIV? HIV or human immune deficiency virus, the virus that attack the immune system, the defense mechanism against any body, any foreign bodies in our body. And it belongs to the lenteroviruses subgroup of retroviruses that cause a slow infection with a long incubation period. And it's the main cause of AIDS or acquired immune deficiency syndrome. Now, This picture shows us the structure of HIV. It has a cylindrical core surrounded by envelopes containing glycoprotein, which is the, uh, which is the protein containing uh, or mediate the attachment of the HIV to the immune cells. After knowing the structure, we have to know that there is two types of HIV. The most common one and associated with AIDS in a worldwide, which which called um, HIV-1, and the, whereas uh, HIV-2, which is more rare and restricted to the Southern Africa and Western Asia. After knowing the structure and uh, types, we have to know how HIV can attack the immune system by short, interesting video. Human immune deficiency virus attack the immune system, the very thing stops us getting sick by targeting a certain type called CD4 T cells, immune cells, which usually coordinate the immune response. It takes over these cells and uses them to make a copy of itself. As we see, over time it kills more and more of CD4 cells, which lack or weakening the immune system to recognize and fight infections. If HIV is not controlled well by antiretroviral treatment, the body lacks its ability to fight uh, serious uh, epitonistic infections, including tuberculosis, leukemia, pneumonia, and Kaposi sarcoma, which eventually lead to death. going to the second objective which is the stages of HIV. By knowing the stages we can differentiate between HIV and AIDS and we have to know that HIV is the main cause of AIDS. Typically there is three stages. Acute or early stage, middle latent stage, late immune deficiency stage. For the first stage, which, which began within two or two, four weeks after infection, and the person may have symptoms like um, fever, cramps, chills, and uh, night sweats, and may resolve within two weeks. LCD4 count may normal or stay normal. For the middle or latent stage, which known as asymptomatic stage, lasts for seven to 11 years, and the age HIV reproduce in lymph, lymph nodes and remain sequestrated in the lymph nodes and the CD4 counts remain stable. For the late, late immune deficiency stage, which is typically AIDS and manifests by decline in the number of CD4 cells to below 200 per microliter and an increase in frequency and severity of a infection. 
Now going into the interesting part with it, which is the mode of transmission of HIV. Typically in the infective individu individuals, HIV present in all body fluids, blood, uh, semen, vaginal secretion or pressed milk. So it can be transmitted by sexual contacts, sharing needles, mother to baby during pregnancy, birth or breastfeeding. But note, it's not transmitted by air and water, so we can swim with them at the same pool. Saliva, sweet tears, unless be direct contact with infected blood, insects or pets, sharing toilet food or drinks. We can sharing food or drinks with them also. We don't have to be afraid from them. For the risk factor, people with the sexually transmitted diseases like cephalus are uh, at high risk and the uncircumcised male at a higher risk more than a uh, circumcised male. This shows us the highest percentage for transmission by sexual contact and the lowest percentage, percentage for transmission from mother to her child because we can avoid it by taking some measure. We can talk about it later in prevention. Now going to the last part, which is the most important part of my presentation today, which is management and prevention of HIV. Currently, no effective treatment. Once people get HIV, they have it for life. But long-term suppression can be achieved, so there is a two specific goals of treatment which are to restore the immunological function and to reduce the viral load. For prevention, no vaccine is available. To get preventing from HIV, we have to take some measures like using condoms, never sharing needles, C-section for delivery and uh, pre-exposure prophylaxis for pregnant women and avoiding breastfeeding after birth. Taking some pre-exposure and post-exposure prophylaxis, it will be helpful. Last but not least, there's interesting fast facts about HIV. More than 1.1 million people in the United States are living with HIV infection. Nearly one in six individuals infected with HIV are unaware that they are infected. The only way to, to know to have, have you uh, get HIV or not is getting, by getting text, uh, tested. By knowing your status, you can make a healthy decision for preventing or getting the HIV. World AIDS Day takes a place on 1 December each year. It's an opportunity for us to support people live with HIV and to fight the HIV infection. In conclusion, education appears to be an effective way to reduce the number of people who will suffer or die from HIV. References at the end of my presentation. Stay safe. Thank you. Hello everyone, uh, my name is Ahmed Farjani. Welcome to my vlog. And uh, I'm first year medical student at the Applied Medical uh, Science at Lima University. And today I will be presenting my title related to the, our uh, main topic, which is smoking cessation and the symptoms of nicotine withdrawal. Okay, my objectives here, I will define tobacco and also I will list the causes of smoking diseases, outline the signs and symptoms of nicotine withdrawal and list the side effect of smoking cessations alternative. Okay, first, let me start with the history of tobacco, the basic overview about tobacco, or how can we define tobacco. Tobacco is a plant found nearly all around the world. It was discovered by Native Americans 8,000 years ago and started cultivation it 5,000 years before, uh, before Christ. Uh, the, the Native American, they were use the tobacco plant uh, in religion ceremonies and also as a medical drug. So they believe that this plant can heal every disease and problem found in our bioactive uh, body. Here are the clinical diseases of the tobacco, uh, loss of pulmonary function and also increased bronchial hyperresponsiveness, cardiovascular diseases and also pathologic changes of emphysema. Okay. 
Uh, nicotine withdrawal. Nicotine withdrawal is the signs and symptoms that appear physically and mentally to the smoker after he quit smoking. Okay, so here we have the signs and symptoms. First, we have appetite. Appetite is the increased feeling of hunger. It starts actually before the smoking. Stop uh, smoking. You know, from the last cigarette, the feeling of appetite will slightly increase, and 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 the the, the smoker starts to feel more hungry. And also here we have nicotine craving. Nicotine craving is also the feeling of wanting more nicotine. And this exactly comes as a flimsy part. Flimsy part means it comes, you know, takes 15 minutes and this, this feeling go uh, away and then it comes back, take 15 or 20 minutes and also go away. So uh, it's like this. Also we have coughing. Uh, coughing is, as we all know, uh, in our respiratory systems, we have microorganisms which uh, called uh, cilia. These cilia uh, clear our respiratory system. So as a smoker, while you are smoking, the, the cigarette have uh, small complexes or substances that accumulate in our respiratory system. So uh, when you quit smoking, this cilia will activate again and start to clean up our, our respiratory system. So this was the result in coughing and taking out these complexes and substances out of our respiratory system. And also we have headache. Okay, headache, this mechanism of, uh, of feeling headache exactly is because of when you reduce the dose of nicotine, as a reaction of our body, the adrenaline will increase, you know? So after this, uh, and as we all know, what adrenaline causes to our body, it's a cause a small vasoconstriction, you know, it's like slightly low vasoconstriction, you know, especially in the brain. So this will increase the blood, uh, the, uh, will, will increase the, uh, the, the, uh, the fast of the blood all around our brain and cause the headache. So the main mechanism is here because of the vasoconstriction and increasing the speed of the bloodstream around the brain, okay? And also here we have anxiety and irritability. Anxiety, uh, uh, anxiety and irritability, these two points exactly related to two hormones in our body, which is serotonin and dopamine. These two hormones, while you are smoking, your body will secrete them, you know, with a high dose or a high amount. This provides the smoker with a good and uh, good mental mood and he will feel like everything is okay and you know have a perfect mood while he's smoking. So when you cut off the, the nicotine dose, suddenly these two hormones will uh, you know re-secrete again as a normal dose in the body. So this, uh, because of this or as a result of this, the smoker will feel that you know angry and uh, more active and stuff like that. Here we have tobacco alternative. Uh, there's many ways, or especially two ways, that we can, uh, as a smoker, take uh, to, you know, to cure ourselves if we decide to quit smoking. The first, uh, the first uh, therapy here we have nicotine replacement therapy, which is NRT, and also here we have varincline, which is Chambix as a scientific name. Okay, nicotine replacement therapy available as nicotine gum. You can take it as a chewing gum you know, instead of smoking. And also here we have nicotine patches. It's like patches as you put on the skin. Also here we have micro tabs and uh, lozenges and also inhalators and nozzle spray. You know, it's like you spray it in your mouth or spray it in your nose, okay? So the targeted people that can use the NRT or nicotine replacement therapy, the adults in general, and also the, te uh, the teenagers, even the children from 10 to 12 years, or let me say that the children that, who have just started smoking. Also here we have pregnant women and breastfeeding women. The adverse effect of NRT is skin irritation when you use the batches. So when you put the batches, one of the uh, points that can be used uh, instead of taking the nicotine is the batches, as I mentioned before. So when you put the batches, after it takes a time uh, on your skin, when you take it out, you feel like there's a, a red area or a patch found in your skin. So this, so this is one of the adverse effects of uh, the NRT. Also, irritation of, uh, irritations of nose and throat or eyes. Uh, this exactly happened if the, the, the smoker decide to use the, uh, the way that is related to the spray, especially in the nose or in the mouth. So sometimes an irritation happened to the nose uh, and this result of coughing and sneezing and so on. Also, we have difficulty sleeping and insomnia, a headache, as I mentioned before, because of the vasoconstriction and the increasing of the uh, adrenaline amount, and also here, an, abs uh, an absent stomach because of the increased GIT mortality. 
Varenkline or Chambex as a scientific name. Varenkline is a slightly you know, more effective or more stronger than the NRT. This is because of the Varenkline cut the necadine dose you know, sadly, uh, uh, on the body, and also cut the uh, the substance or 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 the, uh, the the diseases that related to this uh, this uh, plant. So the targeted people that can be used this uh, this type of drug is most of the smoker targeted in general. But only here we have some cases, which is children and teenager under 18 years. As I mentioned, because it's like more stronger than the uh, nicotine replacement therapy, so uh, they they think that it 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 cannot be used with the teenagers and children. Also, women who are pregnant or breastfeeding, because you know have a problem, it might be cause an adverse effect or problem to the fetus in general. And also here we have the people with severe kidney disease. As we all know, after the drug takes a time uh, in the body, it will, you know, kick out by the kidney. So uh, the, uh, the, the, the varenkline is slightly stronger, so it might affect the kidney. For the conclusion, as a doctor, I want to, to, to tell you that uh, smoking is a really bad habit. Uh, your family need you as a healthy man. Uh, they, they want you with them. And uh, also here, I have a quote from a doctor whose name is uh, George uh, Shaw, he said, a, when you smoke, or the smoking is, uh, the tobacco is a, is a pinch of tobacco plant rolled in a, in a paper with a fire in the end and a fool in the other end. So I don't want you to be that fool. So I, I hope after this presentation, you stop smoking and be more healthy. Thank you very much. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Ziad Mahtaz, and I'm from the Faculty of Applied Medical Science. Today's topic is about mental health. I'm going to be talking about global mental health, a very broad and interesting subject. Some of the objectives that I'm going to be covering today include defining what mental health is, understanding the concept of well-being and how it relates to public health, really understanding why public health is important or outlining aspects of well-being at the national level, as well as defining global mental health and getting into some of the challenges of mental health and how are some health systems addressing this challenge right now. Let's first start by just defining mental Let's first start by defining mental health. Mental health includes your emotional, psychological, and social well-being. It affects how we think, feel, and act, and it also helps us determine how we handle stress, how we relate to others, and how we can make choices. So what are some factors that contribute to mental health? Number one, your biological factors, such as your genetic makeup. Second, is gonna be your past experiences childhood trauma, abuse, and lastly, positive family history of mental illness. So now that I've just mentioned that mental health is the emotional, psychological, and social well-being, why is well-being useful for public health? Simply put, well-being integrates both mental health, the mind, with the physical health, the body, resulting in more holistic approaches to disease prevention and health promotion. In order for us to understand how it can relate to health promotion as medical students, we need to change the way we think about health from a perspective of medical students, because health is more than just the absence of disease. According to the Centers of Disease Control and Prevention, increased levels of well-being are associated with a reduced risk of disease, illness, and injury, as well as increased immune functioning or better immune functioning, speedier recovery, and increased longevity. Moving on, what are some aspects of well-being at the national level? How can we see this at the national level? Well, numerous studies have examined this associations between determinants of individual versus national level of well-being. In general, the results showed that life satisfaction depends on availability of basic needs, food, shelter, and income, while as well as ac having access to modern conveniences. This can include electricity, cars, and such. Otherwise, the pleasant emotions depended on having strong, supportive relationships. So now, how can we prove this? An easy example is that societies with increased levels of well-being are those that are more economically developed, they have effective governments with low levels of corruption and high levels of trust, and they can meet the citizen standard for basic food and health. All right. This brings us to today's main topic and the current issue within mental health, global mental health. Let's first start by defining global mental health. Global mental health 
is the international perspective on different aspects of mental health. It's a new field that deals with the study, research and practice on improving mental health worldwide, as well as achieving equity al-adl, in, in mental health for all people. It also deals with the treatment gap in global mental health, as well as recognizing the inequity in low and middle income countries. So you've all just heard me talk about a treatment gap. What is a treatment gap? Globally, it's the presence of the major discrepancy between the number of people living with mental disorders and the amount of evidence-based cost-effective treatment available to them. In simple terms, it is the high need or high demand versus the lack of access. So this takes us to the global burden of disease. The American Psychiatric Association, otherwise known as the APA, reports that neuropsychiatric diseases attributes for over 10% of the global burden of disease. It is the leading contributor of years lived with disability. As we can see here on this chart, we have the latest record taken in 2017 of the global burden of disease. And as you can see that mental and substance use disorder, self-harm, interpersonal violence, as well as conflict and terrorism all lie under the same umbrella of mental illness, thus contributing to over 10%. So what are the challenges in global mental health in regards to the treatment gap? Number one is that paradoxically, بشكلين متناقض, this gap exists at a time when evidence-based inter interventions of mental health have been proven to be effective in low middle income countries, otherwise known as limited resource environments. So this begs the question of why that is. In my opinion, stigma. Stigma is the main reason. Stigma is a barrier to service uptake. Factors that influence stigma include lack of knowledge regarding mental illness, as well as prejudice and discrimination against people with mental diseases. The other reason, the other cause is restricted or limited resources. In developing countries, physicians and healthcare providers have to think in terms of a generalist. That is because mental health care providers or professionals are extremely scarce in developing countries. According to the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine, nine out of 10 of all mental health resources are concentrated in 5% of the world. That's crazy. Next is that mental health currently is not a global priority. That is because global health, the key element of global health is equity, al-adl. In other words, reducing health disparities among all. Therefore, one can argue that mental health should lie at the heart of global mental health, or mental health should lie at the heart of global health. As we can see here, this is because that patients with mental illness systematically experience worse qualities of lives as well as shorter lives. This is in all societies across all social classes. Inequity. According to the World Health Organization, 95% of all research dollars in mental health are spent only again in 5% of the world. Another statistic is that 80% of people living with mental disease don't have access to quality treatment. So why is that? Due to lack of research capacity to understanding mental illness as well as mapping new treatments, we could see that this might be the exact reason for why that is. How can we improve this? Beginning to improve this would involve us to learn the nature of some of these illnesses by looking at clinical presentations, describing phenotypes, doing etiology related work. Not just researching 5% of the population but instead including the other 95% and in hopes of doing so we can maybe hopefully understand the nature of some of these very complex conditions. So now that we've looked at all the negatives, let's see some of the positive side of what health systems are doing or how they are addressing this issue. Although this is positive, it is not enough. Number one, we need to start redirecting our investments. We need to start investing in research that helps us answer how we can deliver this existing proven treatment in places with limited resources or few specialists. Next is global health programs. To this day, most global health programs don't have mental health as a priority condition. Until recently, the WHO uh, d designed the Mental Health Gap Action Program Intervention Guide. This program was designed to be used by non-specialized healthcare providers after national and local administration uh, adaptation. Next, the Comprehensive Mental Action Plan 2013-2030. As you can see in this picture that this, this plan was actually supposed to be targeted to end in 2020. However, uh, it was originally adopted in the 66th World Health, uh, World Health Assembly in 2013. In 2017, however, they changed their target to 10 more years, so to 2030. 
In my opinion, the most powerful tool is compassion, a ta'alif towards others, effectively communicating to the larger public and to, to global healthcare decision makers the personal impact of mental health by moving away from numbers, statistics and figures and actually start talking about people's lives, inspiring a global movement amongst younger people. There is such a growth and increase in demand to, be, to wanting to be involved in, mental, in global issues and in global mental health in particular. University students experience and witness the burden of mental health firsthand by, uh, for recent examples, the pandemic or other examples such as war. Therefore, us university students have to make it our mission to get the message across to the larger public. In conclusion, today we talked about mental health, we saw how it relates to well-being, how well-being is important for, uh, for health promotion and how that's seen at the national level. Then we got into global mental health, the treatment gap, the challenges, as well as how health systems are addressing this. Here are my references and thank you. Hello, good afternoon. My name is Kaltum Gaiden. I'm a second year dental student in the Faculty of Medical Science. So I want a minute of your time for you to imagine um, that one day you open the window and look outside. The sky is not blue, the, uh, the air you're breathing in is not enough for your lungs and the buildings have collapsed due to any natural disaster. And maybe you've lost a family member. I want you to take a minute to think of how would you feel in that moment. From here I get the topic that I'll be talking about, which is the impact of climate change on our mental health. Today I'll be touching on these objectives. First of all, I'll be defining climate change. Um, I'll be talking about the outcomes of climate change, as well as the importance of mental health. And finally, the relationship or the impact of climate change on our mental health. Furthermore, furthermore, I'll be given a take-home message on climate change. So, according to the, UN, the UNFCCC, um, which has defined climate change as the alteration in the composition of global atmosphere due to direct or indirect, um, relation, uh, due to direct or indirect human um, activities. Okay, um, so the outcomes of climate change. First of all, our poles will be melting down, leading to the raise in our um, sea levels, as well as we'll be uh, destroying the habitat of many animals which become extinct. And the agriculture will, always, uh, will also be um, destroyed due to desertation, so farmers will be losing many lands. Furthermore, with our outcomes, um, we're going to have droughts, hurricanes, um, fire breakouts, which I'm pretty sure loads of you have seen in the past year in Australia and in um, Syria. So um, we're talking about many natural disasters. So what is mental health and why are we talking about mental health? Here um, uh, we can, conc we can um, say that mental health is our emotional, physiological, our social well-being, as well as how we think, feel, and uh, act. So our uh, mental health is almost uh, our personality or who we are. It helps us determine um, how can we handle stress, as well, not all the people can hand this, uh, handle the same amount of stress. So mental he uh, health outcomes due to natural disasters can vary from small, um, minimal stress to clinical disorders. So it ranges from anxiety, um, sleep uh, problems, depression, insomnia, to more serious cases such as post-traumatic stress and suicidal thoughts. So heat waves. When climate change, we're gonna have higher heat uh, levels, so we're gonna have many heat waves. So this is the first impact of climate change on human uh, mental health. Um, hot temperatures, as they increase, um, it's been proven that uh, people become aggressive in their actions and maybe their thoughts also, due to high temperatures. Even as um, us human beings say, like it's one day, uh, you sit down and the weather is warm and someone says one little word. That one little word might uh, be very simple, but because it's very warm and you're under stress, you snap and you have a very aggressive um, response. Um, 
Also, studies have proven that people with mental health uh, issues are three times more likely to die from a heat wave uh, and will have many mental um, uh, patients in the hospitals due to um, heat waves. Um, also, crimes will uh, increase due to these heat waves as it's been proven that um, June and July, which are the hottest two months of the year, um, have the highest uh, cr uh, crime rates. And uh, because of these heat waves, not only June and July are going to be the hottest two months of the year, but also, um, but also the rest of the year is going to be very hot, so crime levels are going to be raised. And uh, even when we're looking at hotter cities or um, hotter cities or countries have higher violency than um, cooler cities. And we're going to have many hot cities, so the cooler cities are going to be decreased. Um, natural disasters. So natural disasters such as uh, droughts, floods, um, hurricanes, any of the natural disasters we've previously talking about um, shows many uh, clinical disorders or many problems within the people who witness it or experience the um, natural disaster, such as PTSD, which I'll be talking about in the next, um, uh, in the next uh, slide, uh, physiolo physiological hyper-erosal, um, chronic dissociation, sadness and depression, um, disorganized thinking and uh, behavior, numbing or avoidance. All of these can um, uh, all of these can show from um, in patients that have experienced these uh, disasters or um, uh, witnessed them. Also, poor concentrations. So PTSD, which, which is the most important clinical disorder that comes in patients who have witnessed or experienced a natural disaster, um, which is, um, which is ident identified as um, uh, triggered, uh, which is identifi identified as a terrifying event, uh, either uh, the patient has experienced or witnessed, which is the most, um, it's mostly seen in those patients. Um, so the symptoms are flashbacks, uh, nightmares, severe anxiety, um, and uncontrollable thoughts that lead usually to um, suicidal effects. Um, they can be short term or long term. Um, fire breakouts. So these are just uh, statistically what um, they found after fire breakouts. In Australia, uh, studies have shown 42% of their people who have witnessed these uh, fire breakouts show psychiatric uh, cases. And uh, in California also have shown 33% have uh, major depression, while 24% have PTSD. And Greek wildfires also, people have seen that um, depression, anxiety, and hostility, and paranoia has uh, developed in the people uh, witnessing these fire breakouts. Last but not least is the ec economic um, impact uh, of these natural disasters. So econ economy is um, changed in many uh, places when a natural disaster hits on. So um, we'll be uh, ruining basically companies. So a businessman that has uh, built all their lives on a specific company and suddenly after a disaster lose it, all um, show that they have uh, major um, stress and anxiety and very high suicidal rates as these people are not able to um, change their standard of life um, from like living in a palace or a nice place to like being in the street because they've lost as everything from their natural disasters and uh, some people are just not able to live in different countries um, which uh, they had to immigrate because of their uh, the lose of uh, everything in that specific country. So um, last but not least, um, we're talking about, um, as Joaquin Phoenix or the Joker has said, I think that we've become, uh, we've become disconnected from the natural world, world and we are guilty of an egocentric um, worldview. So we look at our world in one specific view as we think um, as we think we're harming the planet but we're actually harming ourselves as much as our planet. Uh, our planet gives us a lot so I'm pretty sure that we should give the same um, as what it's given us. 
So as a little uh, ending with my presentation, we should, um, we should really consider the climate change and what we're doing to our planet as we're going to be affected more than even the planet. Um, this is the summary and my references. Thank you. Assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. My name is Ala Abd al I'm a first year medical student at the Faculty of Applied Medical Science. And today I'll be presenting about the effect of syphilis on the pregnancy outcomes. So uh, our learning objectives for today are to be able to define syphilis, identify the causes and types of syphilis, describe how syphilis reaches the fetus, outline the effects of syphilis on the mother and the baby, and at the end, we'll be able to list preventative and treatment methods for this disease. So according to the World Health Organization, syphilis is the most common uh, sexually transmitted infection with about six million cases each year. Um, most, most of these cases tend to come from low finance uh, and resource countries. And uh, it is the uh, leading cause of stillbirth globally. So in this diagram, uh, there's 47.8% of births each year uh, that are stillbirths, which refers to the death of the baby to, uh, after 28 weeks of pregnancy. And then 20.9%, uh, which are newborn deaths, and 31.3%, which are uh, babies that are infected but go on to live with various symptoms. So what is syphilis? Syphilis is a uh, sexually transmitted bacterial infection caused by a bacteria called Treponema pallidum. Under a microscope, it has a spiral shape, and it's special because this bacteria only affects humans, so it does not affect um, animals. Um, uh, syphilis will either uh, progress into cardiovascular syphilis, which will cause the enlargement of the heart and lead to heart failure, or neurosyphilis, which, is, uh, which will cause meningitis, which is the inflammation of the meningeal layers of the uh, either brain or spinal cord. And uh, this disease is preventable and treatable. Now, syphilis has three stages. The first stage, um, primary syphilis, is uh, characterized by a formation of a chancer, which is a painless uh, ulcer on the genitals of either male or female. Um, which will later develop into uh, an ulcer on the mouth area or maybe even on the tongue, uh, which will be filled with uh, serous exudate. Secondary syphilis is characterized by formation of a mucus patch, which will have a snail-like um, uh, pattern on the soft palate in the back of the mouth. And this stage is the most infectious stage. Tertiary syphilis is characterized by the formation of a gamma, which is a tumor-like lesion of the soft tissue, but this stage is non-contagious. So after it passes secondary stage, it's no longer contagious. Um, now within the scope of syphilis, uh, congenital syphilis was given a specific name because it specifically has to do with the fetus. Um, so it's, it refers to when the baby is born with this infection, which they've acquired from their mother. And they can acquire it through two different ways, either through the placenta. So when they're inside the mother, um, the bacteria will pass the, the, the placental barrier, enter the amniotic fluid, and infect the baby that way, or through vaginal birth. So after uh, the mother has, has finished her full term and she's giving birth to the baby, they'll come in contact with the chancers that she's developed in her primary phase and uh, the baby will get infected through those. Now the mother will have various symptoms that range from headache, um, loss of hearing, visual impairment, uh, loss of pain and temperature sensations, and bladder incontinence which refers to the accidental or involuntary uh, passage of urine. And all of these symptoms may lead to meningitis, stroke, which is uh, inadequate uh, oxygen supply to the brain, blindness, dementia, which is cognitive decline or forgetfulness, and miscarriage, which is the death of the baby before 28 weeks, because after 28 weeks, it'll be called um, stillbirth. And then the baby, if they uh, survive, the, through the infection and are born, they'll be born with deafness, either teeth deformities, 
which will be irregularly sized um, teeth that are also rotten. Uh, saddle nose, which refers to the uh, loss of the nasal bridge. Uh, enlarged liver, uh, liver and spleen, which is called uh, hepatosplenomegaly. Uh, severe anemia, which is deficiency of red blood cells. Bone damage. Jaundice, which is uh, the yellowing of the skin due to a pigment called bilirubin. Uh, meningitis and rash. And all these symptoms may lead to uh, the baby having to be born before term, so preterm births, and they'll be placed in the NICU, which is, stands for the uh, Neonatal Intensive Care Unit, where, where uh, they'll be hooked up to wires for um, nutrition and uh, respiration, and then stillbirth or neo neonatal death. And for prevention, so the mother should always, uh, before getting uh, pregnant, go to uh, postnatal or prenatal checkups, where her doctor will offer her a um, a chance to take a syphilis test, either through blood or cerebrospinal fluid, and they'll perform a, fil a full physical. And even after the pre uh, prenatal uh, checkup, she should al always go to follow up checkups, even if she doesn't uh, experience any symptoms. And she should also restrain from sexual activity or contact. And if she decides to uh, engage, get her partner to get tested and always have protected sex. For the treatment, uh, there's two different dosages for this treatment, depending on the age of the uh, person that is infected. So uh, for, for newborn up until four weeks, they'll be given a penicillin injection of uh, 50,000 units per kilogram per day every 12 hours. And then after they pass the four week period, they'll be given the same antibiotic for the same um, dose, but every six hours. And the longer they've had this disease, the more subject they are to a uh, larger dose. And there are people that have penicillin allergies. And if that happens, uh, the doctor will either have them undergo a desensitization um, procedure where they'll uh, be able to receive the injection without having an allergic reaction, or um, they'll give them a, an alternative antibiotic. And to conclude my uh, presentation, I'd like to stress the importance of getting educated before uh, deciding to get pregnant, and to always go to uh, uh, routine checkups, even if there's no symptoms being experienced, because the doctor may detect something you never thought you had and uh, it's good to know that pregnancy is very complicated and it is okay to um, uh, experience uh, certain uh, uh, complications and that uh, it's important to be well oriented and mentally and physically ready to endure the possible outcomes or possible complications that may uh, result from, uh, from pregnancy. And thank you. Hello everyone, my name is Noor al a medical student from the Faculty of Applied Medical Science. And today I'm going to talk about the preparing for epidemics. And specifically, I'm going to cover the preparing for cholera, which is a disease that can lead to severe dehydration, and if this dehydration isn't treated, it can lead to death. So that's why its preparedness is important, and I'm going to talk more about it in the next slides. So these are the objectives that are going to be covered today, with the first one being differentiate between endemic, epidemic, and pandemic. The second one is define cholera. The third objective is list the mode of transmission of cholera. The fourth obje objective is the list the risk factors and manifestations of cholera. And the last one is discuss the plans for the preparedness of cholera epidemic. Okay, so most people get confused between the terms endemic, epidemic, and pandemic. So what are the differences between these terms? So basically, the term endemic is used to describe a disease that is present in a constant level in a country. The term epidemic is used to describe a situation where a disease is rapidly spreading in a very short time. Lastly, the term pandemic is used to describe the rapid spread of a disease over several countries and different continents. So in other words, it can be called as the worldwide spread of a disease. So here are some examples of the epidemics that have occurred before. For example, Yellow fever was in the United States in 1820. Smallpox was in Australia in 1828. Malaria was an epidemic in Netherlands in 1829. 
typhus was in Canada in 1847. Uh, influenza was in North America in 1850. And last but not least, cholera was an epidemic in the United Kingdom in 1854. Okay. Now that we know the differences between the terms, some examples of the previously occurred epidemics, let's go ahead and talk about the main topic of this presentation, starting with its, starting with its definition. So, what exactly is cholera? Cholera is a diarrheal disease that is caused by a bacterial infection to the intestines. This bacteria is called Vibrio cholera, and as you can see here, this is its picture under the microscope. An important thing that should be known is that this bacteria can infect both adults and children. Moving on to the mode of transmission of cholera. So basically, cholera is transmitted by the way of contaminated water or food. There's also the person-to-person -person transmission, which occurs mainly due to direct contact with contaminated hands. Corpuses of cholera patients can also be highly infectious through body fluids. And then there's the cholera treatment centers, which can, which can serve as a source of contamination if sanitation measures weren't adequate. The fourth objective is about the risk factors and manifestations of cholera, starting with the risk factors of developing cholera. Poor economic environment and unstable living conditions, such as insufficient water supply, can be risk factors for this epidemic. Underlying disease, diseases and conditions, such as malnutrition or chronic diseases, such as tuberculos tuberculosis, can also be risk factors for this disease. For the gender, women are more likely to develop cholera since they are responsible for taking care of people who are sick at home. And then there's the environmental and seasonal factors. Since cholera epidemic usually starts at the end of a rainy season or at the, be uh, at the beginning of a rainy season or at the end of a dry season where water sources are limited. For the clinical manifestation, cholera is characterized by Sudden, by a sudden onset of profuse, painless, watery stool, which is sometimes accompanied by vomiting. And then within 12 to 24 hours, dehydration may appear. And as I mentioned before, if the patient wasn't rehydrated, death can occur. Moving on to the fifth objective, which is the main objective for this presentation, as it talks about the plans for the preparedness of cholera epidemic. So, as you can see here in the graph, the first part shows the endemic one or the pre-outbreak phase where there are a few constant cases. And then there's the epidemic upward phase where there's an increase in the number of cases. And then there's the epidemic lag phase where there's a decrease in the attack rate. Lastly, there's the post-outbreak phase. And the reason of having higher levels in the post-outbreak phase than the first endemic one or the pre-outbreak phase is due to the person-person transmission. The phase that I'm targeting is preparedness is the first phase, which is the endemic one or the pre-outbreak phase. So what are the plans for the preparedness that countries should follow? The first plan is to engage stakeholders, including United Nations bodies, donor agencies, and implementing agencies, so that they can help the country for the preparation. Public health coordinators and staff should understand cholera sources and accelerators. They need to know the main entry point of cholera, the main route of transmission, so that they can help provide care to other people. Also, ordering contingency stock for more than 10% of the total normal need is an important step. And these items include cholera prevention kits, chlorine soaps, water jerry can, oral rehydration solutions, water purification tablets, and others. And here's a list of the cholera prevention kit's contents as it contains 250 grams of hand soap per person per month. It also contains two o ORS sacks and sufficient water, water treatment products to sufficient water treatment products to permit 40 liters of water per family per day. The fourth plan is about raising awareness. Countries must ensure that communities are informed about and engaged in the preparation plan, and this education must be rapid. Also, ensuring safe water supply is an important step in the preparation since contaminated water can lead to the development of cholera. Constructing latrines is an important step uh, to ensure safe excreta disposal and to eliminate the fecal oral transmission routes. And then lastly, monitoring the few active cases is also important by collecting their information and by making contact with the health service providers. An important note that should be focused on is about the meetings that occur between agencies, as these meetings should happen more often before reaching the epidemic phase to ensure that the country is fully prepared for the epidemic.
In conclusion, cholera epidemic, whether it's mild, moderate, or severe, it can affect a large proportion of the population. So making plans for the preparedness is important in order to decrease the mortality rate and to have high chances to eliminate the epidemic. So these are my references, and thank you for listening. Good afternoon, doctors and fellow colleagues. My name is Saman Mehdoui. I'm from the AMS faculty. Today, the topic of my presentation is mental health and its impact on physical health. My objectives are introduction to mental health, the signs of positive mental health, the signs of mental illness, the link between mental and physical health, and how to maintain positive mental health. Beginning with the introduction to mental health with a little bit of history. Long ago, mentally ill were considered to be possessed by the devils and were kept locked up in tall buildings far away from the community until the 20th century where psychiatry finally began to emerge. So uh, according to WHO, mentally, uh, mental health is defined as a state of well-being in which an individual realizes his or her own ability, can cope with normal stresses of life, and is able to make a contribution to his or her community. Um, so what are the signs of positive mental health? They include positive relationships, sense of accomplishment, meaning and purpose, emotional stability, optimism and self-esteem. The signs of mental illness include uh, signs of mental illness include uh, having uh, feeling emotions deeply, extreme withdrawal, ex uh, extreme mood changes, inability to concentrate, insomnia, changes in food uh, habits as well as substance abuse. So now that we know how mental health can affect our bodies from day to day, how can, our, uh, how can mental health affect our bodies in the long run? Well, there's often a clear distinction made between mind and body. However, when considering mental and physical health, they should not be thought of as separate, as poor, mental, uh, poor physical health can lead to poor mental health, and having poor mental health can negatively impact our bodies. There's a saying that goes, the absence of a negative is not the same as the presence of a positive. And so what that means is having factors such as optimism and life satisfaction can all markedly reduce, uh, can, mar can markedly reduce uh, factors such as uh, serious conditions despite various factors. So beginning with the CVS diseases, Having depression and anxiety can promote CVS diseases by increasing the risk of atherosclerosis, increased rates of, uh, increased rates of unhealthy lifestyles, as well as increased cortisol levels, which increases uh, the blood pressure as well as blood glucose levels, increase in heart rate, as well as an, in an increase in activity of platelets. Conversely, patients with heart diseases are more likely to three times the risk to develop uh, the mental health issues such as uh, mental health issues such as depression and anxiety. Second of all is respiratory diseases. It's been shown that patients with uh, depression and anxiety are at risk of developing chronic respiratory diseases. And this is uh, mainly due to the high rates of, um, this is mainly due to the uh, high rates of smoking and nicotine dependence. Um, however, uh, patients with respiratory diseases are also at more risk of developing depression and anxiety. Next is cancer, uh, bone, or bone diseases. Um, it's been suggested that patients with schizophrenia have a reduced risk of developing arthritis. And this is due to uh, the genetics, lifestyle and institutions, as well as the anti-inflammatory side effects of any psychotic medications. Um, antipsychotic medications. However, it's been suggested that patients with uh, schizophrenia have a, a higher risk of developing low bone mass, and so every one in two uh, schizophrenics are more likely to are more likely to develop uh, uh, osteoporosis. Last of all is cancer. Uh, there's uh, numerous studies that suggest having uh, gallbladder and bowel cancer increases the risk up to two times in patients with schizophrenia. However, um, patients with cancer are also at more risk of developing mental health issues such as depression. And this is mainly due to the uh, high levels of stress, emotional upset, and changes in body image. And changes in body image. So having a coexistent mental health issue such as depression with a, co uh, with a coexisting cancer, uh, this leads to, uh, uh, this affects or interferes with the cancer treatment as well as remission. 
So now that we know how mental health can impact our bodies, how can we as a community maintain positive mental health? We can start by supporting the children, uh, support, uh, uh, social support to elderly, uh, programs that target vulnerable individuals such as minorities, as well as health, uh, mental health programs in uh, work and schools, as well as prevention of uh, poverty and uh, violence and anti-discrimination laws and campaigns. To conclude, mental health is just as important as physical health. And in third world countries such as ours today, mental health is severely neglected. So one of the goals of my presentation today is to give awareness to mental health and its importance. In our, uh, its importance. Um, there's a saying by Dr. Veda uh, that goes, the absent, uh, the present, uh, the uh, mental health is just as important as uh, physical health. You do not dismiss broken bones, so please do not dismiss broken minds. These are my references. Thank you. Hi there, everyone. My name is Mohammed Al Meshbiri, first year medical uh, first year medical student in the Applied Medical Science Faculty. And uh, today my presentation is going to be talk about the childhood obesity. So the first of all, this a little story happened to me when I was a kid, and it is the reason why I've chosen this title. The story is when I was young, I was playing a lot of football in my neighbor in my neighborhood with my friends. One of my friends were considered as uh, of, were considered of the people who has the childhood obesity. Unfortunately, he was always in the in the goalkeeper place. So this, if you are asking why, this is because of uh, of our Libyan culture. So it's our duty to encourage this uh, these people and uh, and provide for them a better environmental for living. From this point, we are going to be uh, having our objectives. One, define the childhood obesity and mention some statistics that are related to it. Two, describe the childhood obesity risk factors. And then outline the childhood obesity disorders. Finally, list some ways to prevent the childhood obesity. So according to the World Health Organization, the childhood obesity is a complex preventable medical issue in the society. And it is measured by the PMI. The PMI is the body mass index and it, and it is defined as the body's weight uh, divided by the square of the body size. Let's take, let's take me for example, I am 55 kilograms and 1.74 meters. My PMI is going to be 18.16. This table is going to show us when we are going to consider the, the individuals underweight or normal, overweight, uh, obese and extreme obese. And of course I am considering underweight. Then we have some factors that are related to the childhood obesity. The prevalence of the childhood obesity has reached 17% in, in the USA. Uh, about 38 million, uh, about 38 million under the age of five have been considered obese in the 2019. The obesity prevalence uh, between the age two and 19 has been tripled in the last 20 years. And overweight adolescents have a 70% of becoming an overweight or obese adult. Finally, the, uh, the children and the adults with obesity have a great risk of facing a social and physiological problems such as low self-esteem and pulling. Then we have the, uh, the risk factors of the childhood obesity. The risk factors, there is four types of them. The genetic risk factors, the environmental risk factors, the behavior risk factors, and certain medications. Let's talk a little bit about the genetic risk factors, and it is subtyped into three. One, the syndrome, such as the Prader-Willi syndrome. This syndrome happened by loss of function of some specific genes on the chromosome 15. This will lead to the kids will be uh, constantly hungry and they will eat a lot, which will lead them to an extreme obesity and the diabetes type 2. This photo shown us a kid, a kid who has the Prader-Willi syndrome, and it is obvious how, is, how he is an uh, extreme obese. Then we have the hormonal, such as the hypothalamic obesity. The hypothalamic obesity, it is defined as the obesity caused by the hypothalamus damage. It may be an inborn damage or a physiological damage. The hypothalamus, it is producing the specific hormones which, uh, which control the body functions, such as the sleeping and the temperature and the hunger. Then we have the monogenic, such as leptin deficiency. The leptin deficiency, it, it's a, it is a disorder 
that the individuals, when, uh, when they're born, they will be in the normal weight, but they are losing of the function uh, of, be, of the appetite. So they are, will be always hungry. This photo shown us a, a 12 month old kid. This kid has an extreme obesity and he can't sit for more than 15 minutes. And unfortunately, he can't walk alone with other, and he can't also walk with other help. Then we have the environmental risk factors. There are one, the food desert. It is mean when it is hard for you to get to the main store or to get the uh, healthy food. Then we have the increased distance of uh, parks and playground. Increasing distance from parks and playground will be associated with increased hours and the screen time. This will lead to an uh, obesity in the, in the childhood. Then uh, physiological, activi uh, physiological activity environmental. This means of the country or if there are any clubs for the physical activity such as football, basketball or any other sport and the parents' knowledge about food, if they are cooking a healthy food or they are eating a lot of the fast food. Then we have the behavior risk factors, such as the nutrition and diet. If the kid have a regular meal or he, uh, he eating at the bed or eating while uh, watching TV. Then obese parents. Let's take, for example, an adopt a non-obese child who has been adopted by an two obese parents. This child has a great risk of becoming uh, of one of the childhood, one of the people who has the childhood obesity because of his parents. Uh, because of his parents, then we have the sleep. The researchers have made it clear the shortened sleep hours is associated with a high risk of the childhood obesity. Then stress, the long and short term of stress as affect the children and it, and it will lead to the obesity. Finally, we have certain medications they will increase the obesity in the childhood. We, here we have some disorders that related to the childhood obesity. One, cardiovascular, I mean by cardiovascular mainly the heart disease and the stroke. The both of them are the leading of death in the 2011. And then we have the musculoskeletal disorders such as the osteoarthritis, then we have the diabetes, and finally we have the mini cancers such as the breast cancer, prostate cancer, liver cancer, and gallbladder cancer. I have made a small question here and asked about 10 and 110 people if there are new any of anyone who has the childhood obesity. About 92 of them answered yes, they knew they knew some. I continued asking how old are they? They, the most of the answers were they are more than 20 years right now. Finally, I asked them if they are facing any uh, disorders that related to the childhood obesity. This is their answer. About 25.7 were having none, so they are healthy and we are absolutely happy for them. About 20.2 had the cardiovascular disorders. About 11% have the respiratory disorders. About 20.2 about had the diabetes. 17.4% have the gastrointestinal and 5.5% have the hypertension. This slide shows us it is why we have to prevent the obesity. And in this lecture, we are, we are covering the childhood obesity. So it has led us to the important question, how to prevent the childhood obesity? The childhood obesity, the, the, the prevention of the childhood obesity is a function of two entities the family rule and the environmental, interve uh, the environmental intervention. The family rule will be mainly in the limit the total amount of sugar, uh, provide for the children an adequate amount of water and vegetables, fruits, and then reduce the TV hours and make sure the children get enough sleep hours and finally try a non-food rewards for them. And here we have the environmental intervention it is uh, uh, such as the provide sport clubs for the children and provide a healthy food in the stores and the schools. And finally, publish an articles about serious, seriousness of the childhood obesity. Conclusion, the childhood obesity is a, is a, serious, uh, is a serious complex disorder, uh, is a serious complex dis disorder in the society, but it is a preventable 
and its risk factors are related to many sides of our lives and it will lead to many uh, disorders that will may be, may be fatal and its prevention may be by cooperation between the family and the environment. This is our reference. And before we finish, we are going to mention a quote of, from the Louis Bastet when he said, in the fields of the observations, chances favors only those minds who are prepared. This presentation has been done under the supervision of Dr. Rehan Abedi, and thank you all for listening. Assalamu alaikum, hello everyone, my name is Lamia. Nowadays, my topic about effect of HIV on maternal and child health. My objective, definitions of HIV, uh, describe infected and uninfected mother with HIV, and discuss the effect of HIV on the child. Describe the effect of HIV on the child, and list the thing it, uh, should HIV pregnant women do. Introductions. My story about the Geneva. In a lonely moment, specifically 2030, Geneva life changed forever. Why your mother, you're sick and reviewed to the hospital? Finally, she asked here if she has HIV positive and she answered yes. The main reason for all this problem, her mother hide the disease or the virus. Before 18 breath, uh, her daughter, a 18 years old daughter, and had not undergone any treatment. After her diagnosis, her husband kicked out from the house and nowhere to go. She returned home. After two weeks, she dies, and his family discovered his virus as well. Her daughter suffering from the psychological social problem. After her death, her mother and didn't have go to school because it didn't have money. After 2060, he was 21. Uh, he was 21 years old, and her father afraid because her daughter didn't uh, didn't uh, didn't marry and have children because infected with the virus. The main reason for all this problem, who your mother hide the disease or the virus. So, you shouldn't hide the disease or the virus because it affects your life and all your family life, like what happened to the Geneva family. Definitions of HIV. What is HIV? HIV is a humoral immune deficiency virus. If the virus attacks the body and the immune system, HIV and AIDS are not the same thing. If HIV cannot treat, can lead to AIDS, acquire immune deficiency virus. Describe infected and uninfected mother with HIV. Uninfected mother, motherhood is difficult for all mother, but the uninfected mother is less clearly ex experienced than infected mother. Infected mother, stress about passing HIV or baby during pregnancy. And also she was afraid uh, because of uh, your children, she was afraid still be afraid for her children. Feeling sad, so she has not begun breastfeeding your baby. Concerns about the safety of the treatment you will receive. Concerns about how to take you care of yourself and during pregnancy and how to keep your baby safe. This is feeling are more complex with women with HIV and you can add it stress during a pregnancy. HIV can pass it from the mother to child anytime, uh, any during pregnancy. Shoulder breath and the breastfeeding, this is called parental transmission. Discuss effect of if HIV on the child. Education. Many HIV children cannot continue to go, to go school because family need them to work, need them to home, need them to work, and the family income. Nutrition. Many children don't have enough nutrition. They might eat rice, pickles, noodles because the poverty. The worst thing in the world, the poverty. Describe effect of HIV on the psyche of the child. HIV often have the deal with psychological and other caregiver reduced parenting capacity. This is challenge can lead to emotional and behavior challenge in the children as depression. Reviews this studies have requirement children from HIV affected families are more prone to developing uh, disorders such as social adjacent attention as depression. You can share all things with family. You can eat together. You can sharing the same toilet, yeah, because HIV transmission by blood. Most children in diagnosis with parental HIV are black, American, and Africa. Let's think what HIV pregnant women can do. Visit your health care. Take HIV medicine. 
the risk transmission HIV or baby can one percentage or less is of you. Uh, reduce saline delivery. And don't breastfeed your baby. Uh, mother of children transmission in 2070. 19 percentage Malawi and South Africa. 17 and 89 percentage Kenya and Tanzania. 50 and 69 India. This is 50 Nigeria. Then my conclusion, education appears the most way to the, reduce the number of people who are suffering from the AIDS or HIV. From the AIDS or, or HIV. So the pregnant women and children should be good management to have a better life. Referencing? Thank you for listening to me. Assalamu alaikum everyone, good morning. My name is Ziad Kimizakis, and today my group members and I from the Faculty of Applied Medical Sciences are going to present to you our findings from a recent lab research study that was conducted here at LIMO's AMS Microbiology Laboratories regarding the diagnosis of urinary tract infections as well as the antimicrobial sensitivity testing. To start, a urinary tract infection, otherwise known as a UTI, is an infection anywhere in the urinary system. This can include the kidneys, the ureters, the bladder, or even the urethra. Next, a urinalysis is a laboratory examination used in the diagnosis of UTIs. The tests involve examining the physical and microscopical and biochemical appearance and properties of the urine sample. Lastly, a urine culture is done. A urine culture allows us to confirm the, the causative agent and pick up the appropriate treatment. Currently, trimethoprim, ciprofloxacin, sulfamethoxazole, as well as ampicillin are the first-line agents in the treatment. However, antimicrobial resistance remains a global issue. First, we're going to take a look at the experimental designs with my partner, Dania Sharia. I will be talking about the experimental design we used in this poster. Urine analysis consists of, first of all, we have macroscopic examination where the appearance and the color of urine is assessed. Then we have, this is followed by uh, biochemical testing or analysis where specific values are uh, measured, including glucose, pH, ketone bodies, uh, leukocytes, as well as RBCs and other values. And this then is followed by centrifugation. Uh, in a uh, uh, this is followed by centrifugation uh, where the uh, supernatant is then disposed and the remainder of the sample is used for microscopic examination. In microscopic exam examination, we look for any leukocytes, RBCs, uh, any bacteria or epithelial cells. Uh, after microscopic examination, we have urine culture where we use the cled agar for the culture of the bacteria. And if there is significant, and this is incubated for about 24 hours, and then followed by sensitivity testing if there's any significant bacteriuria. Um, uh, the, the first uh, culture uh, revealed Proteus mirabilis, and it will be covered by my colleague Ziad Kamazakis. Let's first start by taking a look at a sample obtained from a patient infected with a Proteus mirabilis. The physical examination was normal. However, the biochemical appearance or the biochemical analysis revealed increased white blood cells, 25 leukocytes per, uh, per deciliter, as well as positive nitrites. Now this was indicative of an, of an active inflammation that was ongoing or pyuria, as well as the presence of a nitrate reducing organism. Upon doing the microscopic examination, we were able to find pus cells as well as bacteria. Therefore, we warranted the urine culture. Our urine culture or my urine culture confirmed the presence of a Proteus mirabilis organism due to the characteristic swarming pattern. Now this is pathognomonic of Proteus mirabilis. Next, we had to choose the correct antibiotic. Therefore, antibiotic sensitivity testing confirmed that, the pro that this variant of Proteus mirabilis was sensitive to norfloxacin, chloramphenicol, uh, sulfamethoxazole, as well as tetracycline. Now, tetracycline and others have been deemed not sensitive or resistant to Proteus mirabilis, but in our case, variation did, we found variation in sensitivity. R different reasons for world variation 
are present, including the extracellular protein alteration, specifically the ZAP-A protein. Next, we're going to take a look at a Staphylococcus aureus sample with my partner, Muhammad Yasser. First of all, physical examination reveals uh, normal urine uh, characteristic. Uh, biochemical examination reveals uh, uh, trace amount of albumin, positive nitrate, and, uh, red, and appearance of red blood cells. Uh, the red blood cells under the microscope uh, count from 5 to 10 uh, RBCs per, per high powerful uh, per high power uh, field. Uh, the urinary, the culture growth was uh, Staphylococcus aureus, and uh, then before, then we performed uh, antibiotic sensitivity tests using eleven anti uh, antibiotics. Seven of them was normal; it was uh, sensitive, uh, such as uh, tetracycline, and uh, four of them was uh, resistant. Uh, they are uh, amoxicycline, ceruloxine. Uh, cotrimexazole and opticine. Uh, the next bacteria is Escherichia coli and will be covered by uh, my colleague uh, Maram Radwan. Our urine sample was Escherichia E. coli. Starting with a physical examination, we leave, in, we leave a normal urine characteristic, except increasing in urine acidity. Next, the biochemical examination was done by uh, Depstick test, where there is uh, an abnormal level of leukocyte, glucose, and albumin. The, the urine culture was identified by fructose pigmentin, whereas an E. coli colony appeared dry, circular in shape, yellowish, a uh, dark yellowish in color. Next, the microscopic examination, where you leave a crystals and gram-negative bacilli. Last, our uh, sens antimicrobial sensitivity test, where you leave an we're using uh, 11 antibiotic with them whereas all of them was where all of them was uh, resistance except till azithromycin next our gram negative culture is going to be discussed by dania thank you Our samples urine analysis uh, revealed, first of all, normal macroscopic uh, appearance, uh, normal yellow uh, urine with no turbidity. And then we have that the biochemical analysis and the microscopic examination also showed no pathological findings. Um, then we have that the urine culture revealed uh, insignificant amounts of epithelial cells and uh, bacteria, such uh, uh, seen here and uh, there are many causes for negative urine cultures one of which is urinary tract tuberculosis mycobacteria is a bacteria that doesn't uh, that doesn't grow on the uh, routine culture media used in urine analysis it requires a specific media known as the low stain jensen media however urinary tract tuberculosis is associated with both pyuria and hematuria both of which were absent in our case, and that's why we excluded urinary tract tuberculosis. There are many other possible causes, which will be discussed by my colleague Sama. Another example for unculturable organisms includes viruses, the most common of which Pyloma virus, JC virus, and adenovirus, all of which cause a hemorrhagic uh, cystitis in immunocompromised patients. However, in our patients, it does not present with any uh, hemor uh, uh, hemorrhage, uh, hematuria, or uh, pyuria. Therefore, viruses are excluded. Another cause for negative urine culture includes antibiotic, uh, period antibiotic consumption. This results in the reduced uh, bacterial growth in the culture, which leads to a false, neg uh, which leads to a negative urine culture. And this is of importance recently due to the improper history taking. To conclude. Urinary, the urine analysis is an important diagnostic tool for urinary tract infections. And in our poster today, we discussed uh, four urine samples that were obtained and revealed three different types of bacteria and one negative urine culture. The bacteria include Shisha coli, Proteus marbalis, and Staphylococcus aureus, and one negative urine culture. 
and this is of important all of which were uh, we identified the appropriate treatment by antibiotic uh, sensitivity and this is of importance recently due to the emerging antibiotic resistance thank you Hello everyone, my name is Asin Mehdwi. Today me and my colleague Rana Shimbish, a second year of Faculty Applied Medical Science, are going to present our lab report that is summarized in this poster. The study of this report assessed the relationship between obesity and pulmonary function. The important, uh, the important issue that should be considered that the, the study was analyzed from a previous study. Starting off with obesity. Obesity is defined by WHO as excessive fat accumulation that presents a risk to a health. The issue has uh, grown to epi epidemic proportions. So the rates of overweight has been increasing in a continuous fashion. As you can see in figure number one, it shows the increasing, uh, the increasing rate of the f obesity from 2000s to 2018. We decided to work in this study as obesity is, promotes a physiological and structural modifications that uh, stru structural modifications that make uh, the obese people as a great risk to a range of variety of health conditions, as Figure Two shows, it is associated with stroke, sleep apnea, heart diseases, pulmonary diseases, liver diseases, female disorders, and also it even can lead to cancers. However, the correlation between uh, obesity and lung function is still unclear since there is a considerable con inconsistencies in research in this area. The, uh, the, uh, the aim of this report is going to be discussed my, by my colleague, Rana Shimbish. Like my colleague said, there are different on the obesity and pulmonary function tests. This is why we want to assess the effect of obesity in the pulmonary function test. The pulmonary function test was tested by use spirometer tests. Now I will discuss the material of method of this report. Actually, the first thing the total population were 50 plus percent, middle aged, are both male and female, which the BMI was used to indicate the spirometer and the value acquired from the spirometer test was indicated for the pulmonary function. Spirometer test is done by, actually is done by asking the patient to be settled and explain the procedure to them, and then the patient's nose is clamping. The last thing, you should ask the patient to take a demon inspiration and put the mouthpiece and pull with force expiration. Spirometer test measure actually the following results or the following values. First vital capacity and the force expiratory volume in the first second and the ratio between them. This, the second part of this report is actually the result and the, meth, uh, the result and the discussion. The first table show here are the demographic data of the subject under study which the average of, the, of their PMI was 30-30 kilogram per square meter. And the smoking said there were actually uh, three smoker and the other were non smoker. Table two show the, actually the, show the difference value, difference mean value of spirometer test result that's obtained from the male and female. As you can, as you can see here, all the values are not significant to change in between these genders. The third table shows the correlation coefficient, or actually the correlation between the PMI and the parameters. The first, the first one shows the correlation between the PMI and force of vital capacity, which was a strong negative correlation, and this indicates the inverse relationship, inverse relationship between them. And the second one, the, cor uh, the correlation between the BMI and force of expiratory volume in the first second, and that's indicated the weak negative correlation. And the last one, the correlation between the PMI and the ratio, and actually there are no correlation, and as you can see here, it wasn't a significant correlation. The think about why opacity affects lung function tests. Some study presented the fat accumulation, or actually mentioned the fat accumulation in the chest wall and abdomen, lead to the mechanical compression in the lung and actually the spiratory muscle. That leads to, to reduce the muscle strength. The suggest finding can indicate that the deleterious effect of the obesity on the lung function test, especially the force of vital capacity. My partner Asil Mehdi will explain more and more details about this one. Thinking about these results, 
the correlation between BMI and FEC was expected because obesity is a restrictive lung disease and in restrictive lung disease it is known that the FEC value is the most affected in spirometry tests. Many studies uh, have done about this topic before and most of them showed that there is a correlation between the BMI and FEC supporting our experimental results. However, there is a study showed that BMI has a non-significant effect on spirometry test results and this is probably because due to the different limitations in different studies. For example, the study, uh, this analysis included smokers. They were four smokers that should have been excluded because as we know that inhaling cigarette smoking can cause restrictive airway uh, diseases and uh, it will lead to reduction in the lung function, particularly the FEV1, as you can see here in the table number three, as Rana said, uh, the correlation between them was a weak negative correlation. Also, there's another limitation. In this uh, study, the BMI was used for indication of obesity, and since obesity uh, values only determines the, the, ex the excess of, of fat, Further studies should involve another method that uh, measures the fats, including its distribution, such as the computed tomography method. Although there is a strong negative correlation between the BMI and lung function, as you can see, the, uh, the uh, individual ratio of FEV1 FVC, uh, uh, FEV1 FVC ratio was not that too far from the number, normal value, which is 80%. We can conclude in this study that the correlation between the PMI and the force of vital capacity is a strong negative correlation. This, this result consisted with a previous study that confirmed that obesity and pulmonary function tests and the obesity and the pulmonary function actually the obesity can affect the pulmonary function tests and, and their ventilatory mechanism. However, this result is not consistent with this previous study due to the several limitations of the study. Firstly, the sample size, gender difference and involvement of smoker. Actually, in this study, we need more work in this area. This is our reference, and thank you for listening. Knowing about the carbohydrate content of your food can be a new step in your journey to good health. A glycemic index-based diet may help you maintain or make your meals matter in terms of their nutritive quantity and in, ter and in case strength building is one of your new future health goals then this might be your time to switch to a low glycemic index based diet. Good morning everyone my name is Ziad Kimizakis as student at the Faculty of Applied Medical Sciences and today I'm going to present to you the importance of the glycemic index as well as the glycemic index of some food items that were consumed by LIMO students at the campus cafeteria. What really inspired this project was for us to answer two primary questions. Do people know what they are consuming in their everyday single foods? And the second question was, do we have the right to know what we are being fed when we go to coffee shops, restaurants, or other public restaurants? Some of the objectives that I'm going to be covering in my, in my presentation today are going to be defining the glycemic index, as well as knowing the relationship between the glycemic index and the glucose tolerance test, otherwise known as the GTT. Lastly, we're going to look at some of the correlations between the glycemic index of some diseases and the, uh, the glycemic index and correlation between other diseases. And we're going to take a look at the, at the most commonly ordered foods here at the campus cafeteria and their glucose tolerance curve, calories, and their glycemic index. Starting with first, what is the glycemic index? Put simply, it is a measure of how quickly a type of food causes our blood, levels, our blood sugar levels to rise. This measurement ranks food on a scale from 0 to 100. So what does this mean? Basically, foods with a high glycemic index are going to be those that are quickly digested and absorbed and are going to cause a, a rapid elevation in blood sugar levels. Meanwhile, foods with a low glycemic index are going to be digested and absorbed at a slower rate, thus resulting in a slow rise in blood glucose. So what are some examples of these foods? Of course, foods with a low glycemic index are going to be those that are high or have a typically a rich content of uh, fibers, proteins, and or fats. And of course, foods with a high glycemic index are going to be those that have 
processed sugars, white bread, and the list goes on and on. So how does the blood sugar or how does the glycemic index relate to the glucose tolerance test, otherwise known as the GTT? Well, as we know that the, like, the glucose tolerance test is primarily used in the diagnosis of diabetes. However, it is used for multiple other functions. It's usually performed after a patient has fasted overnight. And some, some factors that influence the results include the absorbance of the glucose from your intestines, the power of your liver to be able to take up the glucose and store it, and lastly, the capacity of the pancreas to secrete and produce insulin. Numerous studies have investigated the relationships between the glycemic index of foods and the subsequent postprandial glycemic response. The word postprandial just means after a meal. The results showed that typically the postprandial blood glucose levels are a better predictor to long-term to long-term health consequences. As we can see here that uh, therefore we can say that lowering the peaks and the fluctuations the lowering the peaks and fluctu no, uh, lowering the peaks and fluctuations of the glycemic index. Sorry. Yeah, lowering the peaks and fluctuations of the glycemic index after a carbohydrate-rich meal is of importance. It is very important to mention that carbo a carbohydrate-rich meal consumed at dinner time is will lead to a significantly worse postprandial glycemic homeostasis. In other words, it will lead to glucose disturbance or imbalance rather than when it was had at breakfast time. This is why we're going to take a look now at some of the correlations between the glycemic index of food and some different diseases. In order for us to understand this concept, we need to understand or we need to remember that foods with a high glycemic index will cause a rapid elevation of glucose in our bodies. The peaks or the, the peaks of blood glucose in our bodies have, have been thought to actually promote to, uh, the development of certain diseases such as type 2 diabetes and coronary heart disease. This is because rapid or sharp increases of insulin uh, followed by the uh, sharp increases by, of glucose followed by insulin result in not only an increase in glycative stress but also an increase in oxidative stress within our blood vessels. This is why low glycemic index meals or diets have been proven to have beneficial, function, uh, beneficial effects to those chronic conditions, such as the type 2 diabetes, ischemic heart disease, and some cancers. All right. So low, why is that? It's because foods with a low glycemic index actually release the sugars slower into our bloodstreams. Therefore, once the sugar is released slowly, we will not have a sharp increase of glucose and therefore of insulin. This will help us in the long term to prevent the insulin resistance as well as it will help us to reduce our body weights. Okay. Our last objective of the day will utilize our understanding of the, first, of the past first objectives. We're going to take a look at some of the most commonly ordered foods at the, by Limo students at the, at the cafeteria campus, at the campus cafeteria, and we're going to analyze the GTT curves and look at the calorie content of each sandwich. For, to, get this, uh, to, get this, uh, to get these results, we did a, we did a small experiment regarding uh, or including 40 uh, to 43 students, which were all tested, which all came uh, fasting to the experiment and tested uh, for their zero sugar, which is their fat or, or their fasting glucose sugar. And then we gave them or asked them to order their, fa their favorite food from the cafeteria. From there, we were able to guess the most common foods and analyze the GTT curves. So for the most common foods ordered, we, start, we have shawarma as the number one most frequently ordered, babuna as the number two, zingar being third, twister followed by mexicanos and fajitas. So to start, with, to start off, we're going to start off with shawarmas. So the shawarma had 359 calories and a glucose curve of a high glu glycemic index. This is because the, the curve showed a peak, a maximal peak at only 30 minutes. And if you guys remember the definition of a high glycemic index, it is foods that, are, that, is, ab that is absorbed and digested quickly and causes a rapid rise in glucose blood sugar. So we could see that there is only a 40 milligram increase in shawarma. Compared to other sandwiches, that is not too bad. Moving on to the next sandwich is Mexicano. 
For the Mexicano, which had only nine more calories than the shawarma, 391 calories, the glycemic index was good. It actually gave a maximal peak at one hour. The peak, however, was only of 37, even less than the shawarma. Considering the size of the sandwich, this is still considered a low glycemic index. Next, we have the fajitas. Fajitas came in with a, with a high amount of calories at 419. However, the glycemic index was good or medium glycemic index. This is because the fajitas actually got their maximal peak at one hour and only increased by around 29 to 28 per, uh, milligrams per deciliter. Next, we have the tabuna. So the tabuna was the most, um, the, uh, the most, uh, the most, was the most different from all the findings as it had calories uh, containing, it, as it contained 522 calories. The glycemic index of it was also high as it increased the blood glucose sugar by 56 uh, milligrams per deciliter. However, this increase was not a rapid increase as it took one hour for the increase to occur. Next, the zingers. Zingers uh, had a calorie in, uh, had a calorie content of 389. This is less than the shawarma and the mexicano, considering that this is a fried food. This is actually very good. But however, the glycemic index increased to the peak maximal uh, the peak uh, glucose con blood glucose level in 30 minutes, and took around 90 minutes to go back to normal to low or back to normal. Next is the twister. The twister was one of the, on the good side or the low glycemic index as the rise took a full hour and it was a f slow gradual rise. The, the calorie content of it was 389 calories per sandwich. And last we have, oh, we did the fajitas. So to conclude today's topic, we need to, we need to, actually reassure people and tell them that we need to ask restaurants and public, uh, public restaurants and other food industry companies to start announcing their calorie content and to tell us the full, com the full components of each sandwich that we eat. This is so we can know what we get in our daily meals and we can measure to get a better and healthier life. These are my references and thank you. بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم والصلاة والسلام على سيدنا محمد أشرف المرسلين أسعد الله يومكم السادة والسيدات الحضور الكريم اسمحوا لي أن أرحب بالأستاذ الدكتور عبد العزيز الحلافي مندوب منظمة الصحة العالمية وصديقنا وزميلنا وداعم من أحد الداعمين الكبار لهذه الجامعة منذ نشأتها دكتورة أمينة سدرة غنية عن التعريف ونتشرف بوجودك معنا اليوم دكتورة دكتورة انتصار الناجي نتشرف بوجودك وإضافة لهذا اليوم نناقش فيه موضوع موضوع الساعة موضوع مهم جدا نحن خلال هذه الأيام كلية العلوم الطبية التطبيقية تحتفل بانتهاء العام الدراسي واختتام الأنشطة العلمية لهذا العام استمرت هذه الأنشطة لعدة أيام اليوم هو اليوم الختامي فيها وتتوج إن شاء الله باليوم العلمي اللي حيبث مباشرة على اليوتيوب تاع الجامعة غدا أو بعد غد أعتقد تعودنا أن نحن في الأحوال العادية قبل كورونا أن يكون عندنا أسبوع كامل علمي يعرض فيه الطلبة الملصقات العلمية البوسترز نتاعهم نتاجهم لعام أكاديمي كامل يعني يقوم أعضاء هذه التدريس مشكورين بتقييم هذا النتاج 
واعطاء الملاحظات عليه الطلبة خلال الأيام الماضية استمتعوا كثيرا بالنشاطات العلمية استمتعوا ب الابريشيشن او الشكر والتقدير اللي نالوه من خلال ما قدموه خلال العام كله شعروا باهميه العمل اللي كانوا يقوموا به وبان مهاراتهم تطورت خلال العام ف وكانوا حقيقه طلبه الكليه عند المستوى من ناحيه الالتزام والتقيد باجراءات الاحترازيه والاتيتيود والسلوك المهذب العالي جدا اللي بصراحه احييهم فيه والمجهود اللي بذل فريق الكلية فريق عمل الكلية في إنجاح آه هذا الإنجاز آه حقيقة الأيام العلمية اللي زي هذه آه تضيف كثير إلى شخصية الطالب تضيف كثير جدا إلى شخصية الطالب وإلى قدراته وإمكانياته في العرض والحديث والتعامل مع المناسبات و حقيقة كانت أيام ممتازة فأنا ما بيش نخصص الآن لكن الشكر والتقدير لكل من ساهم في إنجاح هذا الحدث واللي اليوم يتوج بندوة أو حدث حسيتم في مناقشة بعض الأشياء فيه يكون على رأس الأستاذ الدكتور عبد العزيز الحلافي مندوب منظمة الصحة العالمية وسيكل تأكيد يعني يزيل الغموض على كثير من الـ من الـ الاسئله وكثير من الاشاعات وكثير من الاحداث اللي تدور في المجتمع حول الفاكسينز حول الفاكسينز نتاع الكوفيد 19 وتصنيعه وطرق الوقايه منه وما هي المخاوف التي تدور في المجتمع الان ربما حيكون عنده كثير من الاجابات فيها آه قبل هيك عندنا الطالبة بالسنة الثالثة طالبة استبرق المشيطي هتعطينا برزنتيشن صغير هيك على الكوفيد آه آه 19 وعلى الفاكسين ربما كمقدمة آه ينطلق بعدها الدكتور عبد العزيز في آه المحاضرة متاعها شكرا لكم مرة أخرى على حضوركم وبارك الله فيكم وتمنياتك للجميع بالتوفيق شكرا السلام عليكم أنا طالبة استبرق صلاح المشيطي طالبة سنة ثالثة في كلية Applied Medical Science في Libyan International Medical University اليوم حنقدم برزنتيشن على مدى اهتمام ومدى تعارف الناس بكوفيد 19 فاكسين مدام هو حاجة جديدة اليوم أول حاجة نحن حنغطوا مجموعة من التايتلز أو حنديروا هايلايت على مجموعة من التايتلز حنغطوا A Brief History of Coronavirus Moving along to the history of vaccines and immunization to the causes of COVID-19 vaccine hesitancy and assessing the knowledge with attitude and practices of Limo community regarding COVID-19 prevention and finally just to refresh your memories about how to protect yourself and prevent the spread of COVID-19 The history of coronavirus. طبعا الكورونا فيروس أول من عرف كان 1930 كان في farms وكان فقط في الحيوانات وكان في different strain عن اللي توا. بعد في 1960 كان في دكتور هو هاي the virologist and a physician اسمه David Arthur John Terrell. الدكتور هذا هو أول من اكتشف مع مجموعة من العلماء أول فصيلة من strains من كورونا فيروس في humans. وكانوا كانت هذه سببت نسبه نجاح كبيره لكن الكورونا فايروس في ذاك الوقت ما انتشرش بشكل كبير وكان اول حاجه معرف به ان اسمه بي 814 بالنسبه للهيستوري اوف فاكسينز اميونايزيشن طبعا الفاكسين حاجه مهمه جدا توا في وقتنا وهو مكتسح العالم من يعني a lot of decades من قبل فأول فاكسين كان invented by Edward Jenner. Edward Jenner هو أول من اختراع الفاكسين وكان the first vaccine which was safe and reliable to use. وكان في الpandemic اللي صار اللي هي smallpox اللي هو الجدري. الجدري كان مرض مميت جدا في هذاك الوقت وكان حاجة تقتل في الكبار والصغار. فهو دار الثيرم تاعه وبعدها بدا يشتغل على الاكسبيرمنت تاعه والاكسبيرمنت دارت على جيمس. He was an eight year old boy. أول حاجة خذوا لايف أنتينويتد هو كان لايف أنتينويتد فاكسين خذوا بس من كاوز 
وبعد هي واز انسرتد تو ذا بويز ارم اند ذن البوي لاحظوا انه هو بعد فتره هي ديفلوبد ا جود اميونيتي اجينست الفاكسين وكانت هذه بصراحه يعني خطوه يعني اتجاه المستقبل بخصوص الفاكسينز هو بدايه ادوارد جنر This is a we consider a flow chart. The flow chart. This is what we see in the history of all vaccines. As we said, vaccines are the first one that was developed in the 17th decade from Edward Jenner. Then it flowed through the history. Then we went to who? To the cholera vaccine and the tetanus. We got the polio virus. And of course, this vaccine is one of the essential things to prevent any pandemic. Because of COVID-19 vaccine hesitancy, Brian Kamnish and Nest told me to push to take the COVID-19. Especially when we were in 2020, and he was out from thousands of decades. First of all, we have two main causes. The first cause is safety and efficacy concerns. طبعا هو الفاكسين it is not yet approved by the Food and Drug Administration the FDA لكن هما الناس ال ال scientists اعتبروا إنه يستخدموه ك emergency use لكن مشكلة society إن هي مش فاهمة الحاجة هذه only ال الناس اللي فاهمة الدكاترة ومن ال ال medical colleagues. ثاني حاجة distrust في the government and health organization. طبعا نحنا عارفين توا إن the corona virus منتشرة بشكل كبير على السوشيال ميديا النيوز متاعها والسوشيال ميديا توا يعني يتسح العالم هو اللي مسيطر على العصر اللي احنا موجودين فيه ففي ناس واجد تنشر في فيك نيوز على الكورونا فيروس وعلى الفاكسين تحديدا توا لكن المشكلة شنو ان الناس على قد ما هي تنشر في السلبيات والناس تصدق في السلبيات على قد انها ما تنشرش في الايجابيات ان توا نحنا وصلنا قريب مليار شخص حول العالم خذا الفاكسين فليش ما يتمش انتشار البوزيتيف فايبس اباوت ذا كوفيد 19 فاكسين And finally, we had a student in the gym here, Limo community, regarding the students and colleagues who are present here in the gym on COVID-19 prevention. Of course, in terms of the chart, the chart will show us that there was a large number of them, meaning people who were in good health and were very good, and many of them didn't get sick. So we want to highlight that إن الناس كانت في نسبة كبيرة من الناس حوالي أكثر من 80% منهم يرتدوا الكمام وهذه حاجة بوزيتيف إن نحن نديروا هايلايت عليها. بس في نفس الوقت إن الناس تجنب في المصافحة داخل الكلية كانت بنسبة قليلة، ممكن بسبب إن نحن يعني السوشيال السوشيال كلتشر اللي نحن عايشين فيها الحاجة هذه تكون صعبة شوية إن نحن ما نشوفوش شخص نعرفوه نسلموا عليه مثلا. الحاجة الثانية إن نحنا الناس اللي توصي إن الناس اللي تبي تأخذ التطعيم actually كانت نسبتها كبيرة وفي نفس الوقت الناس اللي تنصح عائلتها وتنصح أصدقائهم تأخذ التطعيم كانت برضو نسبة كبيرة فهذه حاجة كويسة وحوالي الناس اللي تبي تأخذ التطعيم كانت فيت الخمسين في المية. لكن في مشكلة بسيطة أو نقوله إن في شوية تناقض إن على قد ما الناس تنصح بالتطعيم وهي تبي تأخذ التطعيم لكن في نسبة هي خايفة من سايد افكتس أو خايفة من الأعراض الجانبية complications of the vaccine طبعا before to start finally إن ندير refreshing لل precautions measures نحنا لازم درون بخصوص ال covid 19 طبعا كان في قصة منتشرة من تقريبا شهرين على ممثل كويتي الكويتي هذا كان خذ ال covid 19 فاكسين والأسف هو توفى لأنه هو كان حالته حرجة وكان عنده مشاكل صحية ثانية فكان تأثير لها كبير جدا على المجتمع الكويتي وسبب تردد كبير للناس إن هي تأخذ covid فاكسين فهنا يورينا أن قديس يعني ال influencers وال والناس ال leaders لهم كثير كبير جدا مثلا جو بايدن تو البريزيدنت اوف امريكا حتى الفايس بريزيدنت اللي هي كاميلا لما خذوا الكوفيد 19 فاكسين كان تاثير كبير جدا على المجتمع بتاعهم وزاد الريت اوف بيبل تيكن فاكسينز فاينلي تو سمرايز جاست هاو تو بروتكت يور سيلف اند بريفنت سبريد اوف كوفيد 19 طبعا واشينغ يور هاندز يوزنج الكهول بيست روبس We prevent or avoid shaking. خصيصاً إن إحنا في المجتمع اللي بيهنا من الصعب ندور الحاجة هذه حتى لو تلقى شخص لابس كمامة حتى جاب برضو يعني المصافحة هذه عندنا من الصعب جداً إنك تحكم عليه. مفروض يكون في سبونسرز يس كيف متوه بينت إن حتى في ناس هاجين يعني. وللأسف الشديد أنا واحدة من الناس اللي من الصعب نتحكم في المصافحة ما بين الطلاب والدكاترة والعائلة. 
فاول حاجه وثاني حاجه ان تو ستي ات هوم لو اي شخص في لنسك هي جت ستي ات هوم الوير ماسك طبعا نحن تو عارفين ان الماسكس تو عند مختلف الاشكال في ماسكس ذي ار ميد اوف وول في كوتن سيرجيكال ماسك نحن اغلبيتنا هنا لابسينها في القاعه كم الاودينس وفي حتى ال N95 ماسك اللي هو ينصحوا فيه فقط لانه هو يعني استعماله يكون مفروض في الكراودد بليسز بس ما يكونش في اي مكان Avoid shaking hands, don't share personal things. بصراحة يعني هنا لاحظت حتى للأسف في الكلية حتى برا الكلية إن في ناس they share personal stuff يعني زي الماسكس وهذه حاجة خطيرة جدا إن هم مش مدركين بالخطر اللي هم قاعدين يدروا فيه. أنت ما كيف تعرف إن الشخص هذا is not infected أو ما عندهش أي diseases ثانية؟ فهذه مفروض ندور على highlight. Keep your distancing. يقولوا إن from one meter to six meters على حسب the distance. لكن we should keep our distances. وطبعا عشان نطبق الحاجة تذينا لازم ياخذ وقت. الحاجة الكويسة ان الناس بدات توا تلبس في كمامات حتى في الاماكن العامة لان خصيصا اول ما طلع الكوفيد 19 الناس ما كانتش مهتمة ما كانتش تلبس في الكمامات. لكن توا في امبروفمنت في بوزيتيفيتي لكن ما زال محتاجين احنا نشتغلوا على بعض الحاجات وكيف ما قلنا منها شيكينج هاندز ومنها كيبينج ديستنس بين يو اند ذا اذر. And finally, a heavy quote: Yes, you can still get COVID-19 even if you get vaccinated. But remember, even if you wear a seat belt, you could still die from a car crash. So why do we wear us on seat belts? Uh, so break your fears and get vaccinated. These are my references, and thank you so much for listening. <laughs> is to ask, يعني, the frequently asked questions, rather to spread the, the outcomes of this discussion into the, the, the public يعني, uh, communities and groups that are in the family or in the social media, if it's or in the surrounding people. Because the majority of the community is the in the university. So after having some, some discussion يعني, on this important issue, we can maybe نبدا تو سبريد النولج ممكن تكون فوكال بوينت اوف سبريدنج التوعيه المجتمعيه ممكن نستدعي بعض الجهات العامه برضه والمدارس وكذا ممكن حتى الطلاب يكونوا بارت اوف ذا كوميونتي اورينتيشن عندنا صراحه طلاب فيري براود طلاب من سنه اولى موجودين طلاب من سنه ثانيه وثالثه فهم ممكن برضه يكونوا يعني في محيطهم ناشرين لثقافه الفاكسين او يكونوا عارفين كيف يردوا على الاسئله المتعلقه بالكوفيد فاكسين ضيفنا اليوم صراحة أنا بعتبر يعني متحدث يعني استثنائي صراحة أنا يعني كل كل ما أعرف بالدكتور مستحيل يعني أوصل لل للإكزاكت يعني سيرتيفيكيت لكن حبدأ بالأشياء البينة هو بروفيسور عبد العزيز الإحلافي بابليك هيلث أوفيسر إن دبليو تش أو منسق الدبليو تش أو أكيد واحد من الناس اللي هم سيفينج ذي ذي Uh, the country, صراحة during the COVID uh, pandemic, بالإضافة إنه كان في the front lines دائما في خلال الجائحة. Uh, الدرجات العلمية هو خريج كلية الطب uh, جامعة جاريونس، الماجستير في جامعة جلاسكو في UK on dermatology، PhD جامعة أوكسفورد UK uh, uh, dermatology اللي هي uh, طبيب uh, متخصص أو consultant dermatologist، بالإضافة إنه كان clinical research fellow at أوكسفورد، عميد كلية الطب جامعة عمر المختار uh, في البيضة. عدد من المناصب اللي يعني صعب ان انا ابدا احصل فيها فاكيد احنا ان شاء الله ويل جيت ذا ماكسيمم بينيفيت ديورينج هيز سبيتش واذا في سؤال بعدها بعد الكلمه يا ريت لو كل المجموعات تحضر الاسئله وبعدها وي كان اوبن يعني ذا ديسكشن فور ذا فور ذا بريزنتر اند ايفن ذا سبيشاليست اللي موجودين معنا بروفيسور امينه والاذر دكتورز شكرا تفضل دكتور هذه الجامعه التي أعتقد زيارتي هذه إلى الزيارة الثالثة أو الرابعة كانت بدون مجاملة مميزة بكل تفاصيلها مميزة بأساتذتها الأجلاء مميزة بطلابها مميزة بكوادرها الإدارية مميزة بمناهجها المواكبة للتطور الزيارة الأولى كانت تقريبا عام 2009 من ضمن فريق اعتماد الجامعة كانت المهمة محددة في اعتماد المناهج ومنذ ذلك العام تقريبا من 2009 والتطور مستمر في هذه الجامعة الزيارة الثانية كانت العام الماضي يوم 3 مارس بالتحديد أو 5 مارس في الواقع كانت في بداية ظهور الجائحة في 
في ليبيا وفي العالم بصفة عامة وكنا كان محور النقاش هو كيفية التشخيص والأمور البيزك الخاصة بالكوفيد تطور الهائل والسريع يعني في خلال سنة اليوم نحكو على التطعيمات غير مسبوق مع حد هذا طبعا تطور التطعيمات في الغالب مش يتم اعتماد تطعيم معين فترة تأخذ حوالي نحكو على عشرين سنة على الأقل التطعيمات تحدث في سنة واحدة تطعيمات غير مسبوقة هذا طبعا الجانب الإيجابي للكوفيد 19 الكوفيد 19 عندها عدة جوانب إيجابية غير المآسي اللي حصلت في اجتماع المورتاليتي والمورتاليتي الشيء الثاني طبعا يعني سعيد جدا معنا قابات كبيرة يعني الدكتورة أمينة والدكتورة انتصار والأستاذ الدكتور عبد الله هاي ساعدونا في الفس يعني في في محاولة إن ما قدمته استبرق كانت محاولة مهمة لأن لا أعلم بوجود دراسة ثانية تبين مثلا نسبة الإقبال أو العزوف هي مشكلة عالمية طبعا يعني لو نحكو على دولة زي أمريكا بال بالحجم الهائل اللي حصل فيها من مآسي نسبة العزوف في أمريكا تصل إلى ثلاثين في المية باقي الدول الأوروبية في العشرين نحن نحكو على عشرين اثنين وعشرين في المية فهي مشكلة ليست خاصة بنا فقط يعني في ليبيا لكن في أثناء نقاش كان في الصباح مع سيد الأستاذ الدكتور عبد الله هو سبب رئيسي في ليبيا هو غياب المعلومة غياب التواصل مع المواطن كنا عارفين ان عمدة نيويورك اللي هو تحصل على من افضل الجوائز بتاعت الاعلام ايمي اوورد عمدة نيويورك كان يطلع يوميا على شاشات التلفزيون نيويورك كانت اعلى اصابات على مستوى امريكا كلها في الكوفيد الان اقل اصابات بسبب التواصل والتوعيه يعني على مدى تقريبا 111 يوم يوميا كان يطلع ويوضح بكل شفافيه المعلومات اللي تتعلق بالكوفيد واهمها اخيرا معلومات الفاكسينز لما نحكوا على الفاكسينز انا ما عادش نحكوا على الكوفيد شنو الحجم عارفين ان الوباء في ليبيا الان يمكن اكثر من 175 الف حاله الوفيات في ليبيا تقريبا اكثر من 3000 وشويه في العالم طبعا ارقام حدث ولا حرج نسبه التطعيمات اللي وصلت الى ليبيا الان تقريبا 765 الف تطعيم يعني نحكوا تقريبا الايقاع بتاع التطعيمات لما بدل التطعيمات في ليبيا مازال ايقاع بطيء يعني حوالي 5% من البش من الـ من الناس الفئات المستهدفه اعلى بالنسبه بك يعني ممكن 20% يعني هم الناس الفئات الاختطار لكن النسبه العامه في ليبيا حوالي 5% هذه هي نسبه التطعيمات في امريكا اليوم نحكي على مليون حال تطعيم يومي والصين وصلت الى مليار وشويه نسبه التطعيمات في العالم كلها 3.5 something مليار يعني في ايقاع سريع جدا يعني تقريبا تو الرقم في على مستوى العالم حوالي 20 او 27% من العالم تم تطعيمه لكن لا يوجد عدد حقيقي في التوزيع الغالبيه العظمى في 27 دوله هي تعتبر من الدول الاغنياء في العالم يعني لما نحكو على افريقيا ولا الدول الفقيره طبعا النسبه رقم ضئيل جدا يعني. الاسباب اللي تؤدي الى العزوف طبعا غير غياب المعلومه الحقيقيه لان احنا عارفين عندنا مجموعه من الفاكسينز وكل مواطن من حقه يسال لصحته وخاصه في جدل على نوعين من التطعيمات بالتحديد نحن في ليبيا عندنا كم نوع من التطعيمات جونسون عن جونسون مع وصل ايضا موجود في ليبيا وهن اثنين كانت لهن علاقه التاثيرات الجانبيه اللي في البدايه نحن نقول حوالي ممكن اللي هو حدوث الجلطات ترومبو ترومبوسيتك سايتوبيريك هيموريج سمثينج هذا كان يحدث في في البدايه يقولوا اربعه في كل في كل مليون عدد يعني يعتبر هم ما فيش حاجه تاكد انها هل لها علاقه مثلا يعني كمقارنه يعني هو رقم متوقع بالنسبه لفئات الاختطار الكبار في السن ام لا لكن ما كانش فيه تواصل وفي شرح للناس لما لما عملوا مثلا هم مقارنه كنت المه... يعني نسبه انك انت تصاب بالكوفيد خاصه في السن الكبيره كل ما تكبر في العمر كل ما تكون فرصه الاصابه طبعا خاصه في اذا كان في كوميونتي ترانسميشن عالي كل ما تكون فرصه المرضى والوفاه اكثر بكثير وكل ما تكبر في العمر كل ما تقل التاثيرات الجانبيه بتاع الفاكسينز يعني التاثيرات اللي هي سجلت في الغالب كانت يعني الدراسات ما زال ما اكدتش لكن ترى انها هي في فئه في سن 
صغيرة في السن وفي في في نساء غالبا وعندهم اصلا هيستوري او استعداد انه ممكن يحتل في المشاكل طبعا الهجوم المضاد للتطعيمات ظاهره قديمه جدا يمكن من ظهور تطعيم الدفتيريا زمان لما طلع وبعدين راوا العالم انه لازم تكون فيه منظومه ترصد كل التاثيرات الجانبيه في العالم الكلام هذا في الستينات ما هو جديد يعني لما عملوا المنظومه اللي هو الفيروس ثينك الشورت نيم بتاعها اللي هو فاكسين ريسك اند سايد افكت سمثينج لايك ذس هذه المنظومه هذه هي اللي استغلت من قبل الناس اللي هم بيوجهوا في رسائل مضاده للتطعيمات فبالتالي ما يعطوك حقائق يعطوك نص الحقيقه او يعطوك الجانب زي ما حكيت انت الحاجات السلبيه وما يجيبوش الحاجات الايجابيه في التطعيم والدور الاساسي في الواقع هو دور الاعلام بالنسبه للامور الثانيه اللي تتعلق بالتطعيمات يمكن اثناء النقاش اذا كان حابين مثلا نفتحوها كحلقة نقاش إذا كان في حاجة تحتاج إلى إجابة حنحاول نجاوب عليها من منظور دبليو تشو ومعنا طبعا أيضا خبراء أيضا أكيد حيساعدونا في هذا المجال دكتورة أو حد عندها مثلا استفسار دكتور رشاد أو حد طلبة بالذات دكتور تفضل صوتي عالي هو <تصفيق> حضرتك قلت ان في اكثر من نوع من التطعيم صحيح خاصه عندنا في ليبيا يعني يجيبوا مانيش عارف يعني ما صوت الدبليو تشو ولا ما الله اعلم لكن مثلا يجيب لك استرازينكا اليوم بكره ما عادش اليوم واسترازينكا معروف انها جرعتين صحيح ومرات ثلاثه يعني بريطانيا اخذوا لعن ثلاث جرعات باقي لو ما يجيناش استرازينكا اليوم وجانا بعدين سبونتر هل نقدروا ناخذ جرعتين من من ديفرنت صحيح كمبري. طبعا سؤال مهم جدا جدا السياسه بتاع المركز الوطني في ليبيا رات ان احنا نحاول نطعموا اكثر عدد ممكن من الناس يعني بدل ما نعطوا مثلا الشخص نعطوه جرعه ونمسكوا له الجرعه نتاعه باش لما يجي بعد اسبوعين ولا ثلاثه ولا بعد اربع اسابيع على حسب التطعيم نعطوه الجرعه قالوا لا خلينا نحن نطعموا اكثر عدد ممكن وننتظر ممكن نحصلوه ممكن لا، طبعا هذه مشكله مش بس في ليبيا حصلت في دول زي كندا. كندا استخدموا تطعيم فايزر في فتره من الفترات ما حصلوش التطعيم بدوا في تطعيم استرازينيكا كجرعه ثانيه. كمنظمه الصحه العالميه ما زالت ترى ان نستخدموا نفس نحاول بقدر الامكان ان نستخدموا نفس التطعيم. لو تخ... لو لو الفتره طولت إلى متى يعني مثلا نقول عند 12 أسبوع إذا كان ما حصلش بعد 12 أسبوع تبي تبدأ ببرنامج تطعيمات من جديد يعني تبدأ ما كأنكش خذيت التطعيم في الواقع لكن الدراسات اللي توا كي توا الدكتورة احنا في الدراسات اللي هي بعثها أخير يعني يقولوا إن الناس طبعا اللي هم مصابين بالكوفيد في السابق وخذوا جرعة التطعيم ربما ما يحتاجوش الجرعة الثانية ربما هذه الدراسات الحديثة بين معدل الانتي الاجسام المضاده حيكون عالي جدا جدا هذا كلام مازال ما هوش كونفيرمد لكن يعني موثق في عده دراسات يعني نعطي كلمه للدكتور الاستاذ الدكتور امنه وبعدين تو نعاود تفضل شكرا يا دكتور بارك الله فيك في الحقيقه في حاجتين يا دكتور تو الدكتور قال لو احنا خلينا وان دوز بالحاجه في بعض الدراسات بتقول ان لو احنا غيرنا السكند دوز الانذر فاكسين ات جيف بيتر شانس اللي احنا نحصل على دوز اسبوع بالضبط هذه مش مش مشكله لكن هل هي ابلايت لكل الفاكسينات ولا في انواع معينه ممكن نعرف ديفرنت سكند دوز وفي انواع شكرا ابلايت ذا سيم دوز يعني سيم فاكسينات تمام الاستاذ الدكتور طبعا هو فكره ان انك تستخدم نوعين من التطعيم ميكس اند ماتش هذه ايضا حصلت حتى في دول حتى في روسيا طبعا طبعا روسيا للاسف الناس ما عندهمش مصداقيه او نحكي على الساينتفك كوميونتي ما عندهمش مصداقيه في بعض ال الدراسات او الاراء اللي تطلع من من روسيا بالرغم ان الاتحاد السوفيتي لما ذكرت سمول بوكس كان له دور كبير جدا في التخلص لانه المرض الوحيد اللي تم الاراديكيشن بتاعه هو سمول بوكس وكان التصنيع بتاع الفاكسين اللي تبرعت به روسيا نحكوا عليه جرعه قريب مليون مليار ونص جرعه تبرع به الاتحاد السوفيتي باش تم التخلص والقضاء نهائيا على سمول بوكس يعني عندهم خبره من اكثر دول العالم خبره في تصنيع الفاكسينات 
هم هم الروس عملوا دراسه خلطوا خلطوا فيها سبوتنيك مع الاسترازينيكا وتم تسجيلها حتى في الميديا الروسيه ان ما فيش اي تاثيرات جانبيه لو يستخدموا اكثر من فاكسين كل فاكسين عنده طريقه مختلفه طبعا في العمل سواء كان بتاع الماسنجر ار ان اي ولا غيرها هل ممكن المناعه تكون اقوى زي ما ذكرتي حضرتك يمكن يكون اقوى المفعول بتاع التطعيمات يكون افضل لان حاولنا نحن بطرق مختلفه ان نكون اجسام مضاده تتعرف على اجزاء مختلفه على سبيل المثال من الـ من الفيروس بارتيكلز لكن في ايضا ما زال جزئيه ما هيش واضحه ان ممكن هل كل التطعيمات يعني في يعني في جزئيات من ممكن يكون ممكن يعطون مع بعضا اذا كان يشتغلون بنفس الاليه يعني هذا ما زال هو الاسئله اللي ما زالت تحتاج الى اجابات ما هيش واضحه ما زالت ما هيش بلاك اند وايت بس كيف انا نبي نعرف ان الخداوه وان دوز الريسبوند بتاع از جود انف اللي هو بروتكت هيم سيلف يعني يعطينا ريسبوند 80% 70% ولا كل التطعيم ديفرنت بالفيرست دوز طبعا صحيح الفيرست دوز تعطي مناعه طبعا الفيرست دوز هم يعني الدراسات اللي هي شويه ريسنت تقول ان تعتمد على الشخص اذا كان هو اصلا كان مصاب ام لا إذا كان هو مصاب في الغالب تكون الفيرست دوز قد تكون كافية لأن البوستنج افكت اللي يصير كأنه هو كأنه واخذ تو دوز ربما حتى أفضل يعني حتى أنك تاخذ طبعا في فروق أن في الأمراض اللي هي زي السمول بوكس ولا زي الميزدس الميزدس معروف أن المناعة الطبيعية بتاعه كافية طول العمر يعني لكن سرعة الانتشار بتاعه كبيرة نحكوا على الآر زير بتاعه ممكن 15 وحاجه زي هيك يعني شخص واحد ممكن ينقل العدوى الى 15 واحد. فبالتالي لما نحكوا على المناعه المجتمعيه غير المناعه الطبيعيه، المناعه المجتمعيه كل ما زادت نسبه العدوى كل ما زادت هي نسبه كل ما زاد احتياجنا ان تكون نسبه المناعه المجتمعيه اعلى. في الاول احنا كنا نقول 60 70% ولا لا على الكوفيد، بعد ظهور المتحورات الاخيره اللي عندها سرعه انتشار زي الدلتا بتاع طبعا التسميات بتاعها تغيرت تو باش ما يكونش في نوع من الوصم، الدلتا انتشارها سريع جدا، اذا توقعوا ان المفروض تكون عندنا نسبه مناعه مجتمعيه اعلى من الرقم اللي نحكوا عليه، نقول 90% على سبيل المثال، والمناعه المجتمعيه قد تجي يا اما من نشر من الانفكشن نفسها والا من التطعيمات، مش شرط انها تكون من التطعيمات. التطعيمات يعني في الغالب النشر الاميونيتي بتاعت اللي تحدث هي اقوى من التطعيمات في امراض زي الميزدس باستثناء الكوفيد، الكوفيد التطعيمات اللي حصلت خاصه فايزر ومودرنا والتطعيمات هذه غير مسبوقه في قوه الحمايه يعني نحكوا على ارقام فوق ال 90 95% من الجرعه الاولى الارقام تتفاوت بين ال 70 وبين ال 80 آه طبعا في بعض التطعيمات زي الساينوفاك ولا سبوتنيك الى الان سبوتنيك ما خذتش الترخيص او الليس ان ليستنج يعني في الدبليو شو لانها ما زالوا يستنوا منها باش يعطوها التقارير الدراسات اللي عملت الى الان لم يعني لم لم تسلم او لم ما شاركوهاش مع الساينتفك كوميونتي لكن النتائج بتاع سبوتنيك يقال انها تو بي جود جود تو بي ما يقولوا ممتازه لدرجه انها لا تصدق يعني <تصفيق> فعلى كل حال هو لكن يعني ام شور ان جاست ذا هل التطعيمات هذه حتغطي تغطي ديفرنت فيرينت من كورونا ولا احنا ودون نقول ديتيلز حطيناها سؤال مهم في حد ممكن عنده اجابه للسؤال هذا طبعا المتحورات اللي حصلت الفيرينتس الجديده هو التسميات بتاعها الاسبوع اللي فات زي ما قلنا عملوها الفا بيتا جاما دلتا الفا هو بتاع اللي طلع في بريطانيا في الاول وبيتا اللي طلع بعدين في ساوث افريكا ولا الثالث اللي بعدها طلع في البرازيل والدلتا هو اللي طلع في الهند هذين نسموا فيهم فيرينس اوف كونسيرن معناها هذين قابلات ان يدير انتشار سريع ممكن يدير حتى حتى السيفيريتي بتاع الديسيز تكون اكثر من غيرها والنوع الثاني اللي صنفوه فيرينس اوف انترست يعني هذا لاحظوا انه من من في في او اي هذا منتشر في مكانات معينه يعمل كلاستر يعمل اوت بريك محدوده لكن ممكن يتحول الى فيرينت اوف كونسيرن يعني حيسبب قلق كبير عالمي قد ينتشر ويسبب مرضى وانتشار سريع كل التطعيمات اللي استخدمت الان اللي هي ابروفد تاثيراتها على الفيرينتس 
ممتازة كويس مش ممتازة بمعنى يعني فيه فيه استثناءات بسيطة يعني على سبيل المثال مثلا نقولوا في الـ South African variant والجاما variant التطعيم بتاع الأسترازينيكا حدث فيه انخفاض في معدلات النيوتراليزنج أنتي باديز انخفاض يعني بالنسبة بتاع 8.5 فولد something like this لكن ما زال افكتف يعني لكن في 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 تاثيرات ولكنها تاثيرات ما هيش ذات يعني اهميه كبيره باقي التطعيمات طبعا سواء كان سبوتنيك ولا ساينوفاك الدراسات الاخيره كلها they are still working حتى مع الفاريانس they are still very effective بس معنى هيك يا دكتور احنا كل ما يجينا فاريانت We're going to have a new vaccine if, if it is not effective. Yeah, مش كلهم effective على ذلك. نعم. ده هو هو المفعول متاح مازال كويس يعني ما هوش ما فيش حاجة مثلاً تدعو إلى إنه يكون فيه طبعاً هم طبعاً في محاولات إن حالياً لتصنيع vaccines على حسب التحورات اللي أحسن وهذه ممكن سبوتنيك بالذات بدين في في تصنيع vaccine خاص بالvariants لكن التحورات اللي حصلت إلى الآن الفاكسينات اللي أبيلاب إلى الآن مازالت قادرة على أن تغلب عليها في الغالب في الغالب يعني. الاتجاه فيما بعد يمكن لأن النقطة هذه مهمة طبعا جدا هل يعني بعد الفاكسينز ممكن يتم التخلص نهائيا من الكوفيد وتنتهى القصة طبعا بالتأكيد لا الإجابة لا ربما الاتجاه أنه حيكون في تحول زي ما حصل في الاتش 1 ان 1 من المرحلة اللي هي تسبب تحورات تسبب بانديميك الى مرحله انها حتسبب سيزونال آه مرات تكون سيزونال سيزون زي السيزونال فلو تحتاج الى انك تغير التطعيم سنويا وهذا هو نوع من القلق اللي هو فعلا آه وارد يعني يعني التحورات اللي تحصل احيانا فعلا الفاكسينز الان حتى هو ميزه اللي ربما التصنيع من الفاكسينز ام نوت ان اكسبرت في الفاكسينز لكن حسب الدراسات الاوليه ان الفاكسينز خاصه الام ار ان اي فاكسينز قابله للتحوير بسهوله يعني اذا كان حصلت تحورات كبيره ممكن تعدل في الفاكسين يعني. عندي سؤال هل البريس يلعب دور في الكوفيد 19 فاكسين؟ نعم اعتقد ان في دراسات في امريكا تشير الى هذه النقطه طبعا ما عنديش اجابه واضحه اكيد لكن ام اتذكر ان كانت في فروقات خاصة في 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 الدراسات بتاعت امريكا الاستجابه للفاكسينز بين خاصة الهسبانيك والله الافريكان اوريجن امريكانز لكن مش متاكد من هذه الاجابه. كانت دكتور في نمبر زيرو يعني ماكس بين تو فاكسينز شو السايد افكت اللي في تو فاكسينز؟ تقريبا الدراسه اللي شفتها الوحيده هن حاجتي هن دول تين تقريبا اللي بديت فعليا يعني اوروبا بديين في في تجاربه لكن كندا بديين فعليا وروسيا بدين فعليا، روسيا تقول لنا نو سايد افكتس. طبعا السايد افكتس معناها ان نحكوا على حاجه نحن ما هيش بنحكوا على حاجه السايد افكتس اللي نتوقعوها من اي فاكسين اللي هن حاجات زي مثلا بين ولا فيفر ولا وات ايفر الحاجات اللي هي متوقعه وتصير هذه النسب بتاعها عاليه لكن لما نقول سايد افكت نقصد بحاجه سيريس اللي هي حاجه تخل يعني الرجيك رياكشن قويه ولا حاجات اللي هن زي حاليا مايوكاردايتس يحكوا فيه شويه جدل عليها الكلوتنج ريسك اللي حصل مع الاسترازينيكا ومع جونسون اند جونسون ان هذه لكن ما فيش يعني ما فيش مثلا سايد افكت يذكر يعني على حسب على حسب طبعا الدراسات تاع روسيا وكندا كندا طبعا ما تنسوش ان في الكثير من المجهول وفيها معلومات قد تكون غير متاحه وغير متوفره الا اذا كان زملائنا عندهم اضافه اليوم. لا هو حتى في المانيا الناس اللي خذوا استرازينيكا. معلش اوكي. 
هو حتى الناس اللي في المانيا الناس اللي خدوا استرازينيكا تم خايفين من الريسك بتاع البلوتينج والثروبوزس وكذا فعلى طول غيروا لهم على على الانذر اللي هو الباين بالضبط بالضبط فكان ما كانش عندهم مثلا دراسه واضحه تبين انه هو فعلا صار لهم كومبليكيشن ولا كذا صحيح بلس في دراسه اخرى امس شفتها ان الناس اللي تو اخذوا مجموعه من الناس انهم خلوا السكند دوز بعد 11 اسبوع مثلا المفروض ياخذها مثلا بعد اربع اسابيع ولا كذا خلاهم بعد 11 اسبوع لقوا ان البوستر دوز بعد 11 اسبوع الاميونتي كانت اقوى ما انك تاخذها بيفور يعني صحيح فهذه من ضمن الـ الـ حتى تاخيرتنا نحن ممكن نقول تاخيرها في اخيرها بالضبط بالضبط يعني زي ما تقول السكند دوز لو طولت فعلا الاميونتي تكون افضل يعني صحيح بالضبط تماما يعني التاخير كان فعلا في بعض الدراسات الاخيره كان يشجع ان يكون في تاخير في هذه الفتره الزمنيه اللي حكتها الدكتوره لان النتائج كانت افضل يعني اعتقد ان فهل في دوري اتش او عندها كلير بلانز او زي ما نقولوا ماكرو للفاكسينيشنز بروجرام في ليبيا ولا ستيل يعني بالنسبه للمركز الوطني؟ يس انا بالنسبه لي حاليا احس في الامور يعني نوعا ما ما فيش ما فيش رود ماب كلير يعني انه هو حيكون كذا كذا فستيل الامور بالنسبه لي شويه للاسف للاسف في قصور شديد في في موضوع الفاكسينز بالذات يعني هو في الكوفيد 19 ريسبونس في ليبيا بصفه عامه كان في ثغرات عارفين احنا ظروف الدوله والى اخره الفاكسينز طبعا في ليبيا الى الان ما فيش في بلان وضعت يعني كناشنال بلان تنفيذ الخطه والى اخره لكن يعني التعطيل اللي صار في الافيلابيلتي بتاع الفاكسينز ان من البدايه ليبيا حصل تعطيل في اجراءات بتاع يعني في اجراءات معينه كانت بتقدمها مثلا انت هم ركزوا على منظومه الكوفاكس ما حاولوش انهم يتواصلوا مباشره مثلا مع الشركات اللي هي مصنعه منظومه الكوفاكس لما عملت في الاول على اساس ان عملوها باش نضمنوا حقوق كل الدول انها تاخذ حصتها من الفاكسين 20% من البوبيوليشن لكل دوله منظومه الكوفاكس كان هذا الهدف الاساسي بتاعها وكانت القيمه انك انت باش تشتري الفاكسين ل 20% بتاع الناس بتاعك كانت قيمه بسيطه يعني نحكي على 40000 والله كم حاجه مبدئيه كحجز يعني لكن للاسف الدول المصنعه لم تلتزم وهنا كان طبعا هذه واحده من الحاجات اللي هي كانت في الكوفيد 19 بينت الاخلاقيات بتاع كثير من الدول يعني استحواذها على مش بس حتى بالفاكسينز كان تذكر حصلت قرصنه في البي بي ايز حصلت قرصنه فيما في يعني في الحاجات اللي هي معدات الوقايه الشخصيه والى اخره فبالتالي التطعيمات اللي هي المفروض تمشي للكوفاكس ما مشتش يقول لك الدولة تقول لك انا نصنع في فاكسينز انا شعبي اولى خلينا نطعم شعبي وبعدين اذا كان في حاجه نعطيها الان يبغوا يعطوا مليار جرعه والله بعد اجتماع الجي 7 الاخير للدول للكوفاكس فليبيا اعتمدت على الكوفاكس من البدايه الشيء الثاني طبعا نتيجه البوليتيكال كونفليكت اللي صار ما فيش مثلا بادجت الوكيتد سبيسيفيكلي فور ذيس فاكسين يعني معظم الحاجات اللي جات للاسف حاجات دونيشن يعني فيش وهذا شيء طبعا الشيء اللي هو ممكن في ليبيا ربما ربما مساعدنا الى الان لان الوضع ما هوش فيري سيريس بالنسبه للموجات اللي صار لكن الان الوضع المؤشر الكويس اللي هو عاده نعتمد عليه هو مؤشر مؤشر الوفيات اليوميه مؤشر الوفيات اليوميه في انخفاض طبعا هنا كونفيرم ان كوفيد ديث بيكوز اوف كوفيد الدراسه اللي تتذكر درسوها ببنغازي اللي عملت في بدايه شهر تقريبا مارس في 2020 باش يشوفوا السيرو بريفلنس يشوفوا الناس اللي عندهم انتي بادز للكوفيد 19 ولا كانوا تقريبا 600 حاله ولا حاله كان عندها انتي بادز في ذلك الوقت. الدراسات اللي بعدها باش نشوفوا في انتشار مجتمعي ولا لا كانت محدوده لكن نذكر في في الشهر ممكن الشهر الماضي او اللي قبله قسم صحه المجتمع عمل دراسه في الجبل الاخضر يعني ما نعرفش كم اقل من 2000 حاله هم اللي شافوهم شافوا عندهم انتي بادز موجودات ولا لا حوالي 64% تقريبا كان عندهم الاي جي جي بين الاي جي جي والاي جي ام معناها نحكوا ان في عدد كبير مر عليهم من الناس آه وهذا شيء متوقع احنا 85% من الناس ممكن يمر عليهم بدون اي مشاكل تذكر يعني ربما شيء مساعد ان عندنا الى حد ما فيه بداية ما نقولوش هيرد اميونيتي لكن مازال شوية الرقم تاع الهيرد اميونيتي لكن 
ممكن الرقم يكون اعلى يعني 60% 64% حزي سامبل عدد الصيف مش ريفلكتنج نعم السامبل نمبر سمول يعني مش مكان طبعا طبعا ما فيش دراسات اخرى على حسب علمي يعني حاول حاولوا ان الدبليو شو يديروا فاندنج للسيرو بريفلنس ستاديز وطلبنا وتقدمت جامعه بنغازي وجامعه سرت وبعض الجامعات الاخرى الاليه بتاعت الدبليو شو مرات تكون شويه كومبليكيتد في حاجه فيها فاندنج فالبحاث مرات ما يتا يعني مش عارف هو تقدم بالنسبه لجامعه بنغازي كان فيه في بروجكت دكتور اي ثينك الدكتور بروفيسور احمد الحاسي كان تقدموا يعني نديروا سرت نفس الشيء لكن ما, ما, ما تمكنوش انهم يبدو لي انهم يكملوا السيرو بريفلنس في الفتره دكتور الاي جي بي الاي جي جي الاي جي جي اللي كنت بوزيتيف للناس اللي بعد الانفكشن يعني هي ممكن تعطيك اميونيتي من مده ثلاثه الى ست شهور. برضه هذا مش حتعطيك الاميونيتي بتاع الفاكسينيشن. طبعا. فهم الناس شنو تقول انه لا انا جاني الانفكشن خلاص. وهذه لازم هو مشكله الميديا يعني الميديا لازم تلعب دور في الموضوع صحيح. هذا. صحيح. انه مش انه مش اللي اللي جاء انفكشن من قبل معناه هو خلاص مخصص. طبعا. طبعا. هذا علاش لازم يحكوا على الفاكسين انه هو الاساسي. هذه مشكلة المجتمع لا أنا جاتني كورونا بس صحيح. أن المشكلة يقعد يعني الشخص عنده كورونا ومش مقتنع أن عنده كورونا برضو يعني. أكيد أكيد هذين المشاكل يعني. هي كلها هي هي واحدة من هنا تسعة بيلرز متعات الريسبونس للكوفيد 19 في هنا الرابط ريسبونس تيمز في هنا اللابين كذا واحدة منها المهمة هي الريسك كوميونيكيشن واللي تحكي مع الكوميونيتي هذه هو أضعف بيلر نحن نذكر لما في شهر خمسة في شهر ثلاثة عملنا البرزنتيشن هنا على الكوفيد في بدايه الكوفيد استعرضنا نقاط نوع من التقييم اللي عملناه للاستجابه قبل قبل ما تبدا حتى ليبيا تخش في الكوفيد 19 كان هذا هو يعني نقطه الويكست لينك نحن نقوله في في التسعه بيلرز هذين وما زال هو للاسف يعني. دكتور خاطر بعد لا مستحيل بعد بعد تشوف البيهيفير الاويرنس بتاع الشعب ما هوش ماشي مع النتائج يعني انا متبع الدكتور مرسال في النتائج صح. مش واحد يعني يمشوا العزاء يمشوا الافراح كراود صحيح لكن صحيح. النتائج مش مش كيف الدول الاخرى يعني مش كيف ايطاليا مش كيف ما صار في الصين مش عارف نحن هل عندنا حاجه هيك خاصه لو عندك مثلا حاجه انا عندي تفسير شخصي لكن انا بقول لكن لانه هو طبعا لما لو لو مثلا قسموهن الى مراحل مراحل الكوفيد في بدايته من بدايته من بدايه ظهور المرض وظهور الشائعه بتاعت انه ممكن يكون لا بليك وهي عادت بقوه من جديد على فكره بتاع اللا بليك هذا انك التسرب ناتج من معمل بتاع ووهان مع انه واحد واحد من اثنين معامل في الصين اللي هم عندهم اعلى معايير السيفتي بي اس ال 4 هذا ممكن معدودات على مستوى العالم اللي هو يطبقوا في المعايير العاليه جدا جدا وطبعا هي صح مش وارده لكن هم عندهم ال يعني حتى انواع الخفافيش اللي هي لقيوا فيها الايدنتسي بتاع الكوفيد 19 فيروس 96% والله حاجه زي هيك كذا هي مقاربه لها لكن هم عندهم يعني دافعوا على انفسهم واستبعدوها نظريه الله المراحل الثانيه اللي صار فيها الانتشار الكبير البنديمي كانت لها علاقه واضحه خاصه في ايران وفي ساوث افريكا آه ساوث كوريا الجنوبيه وفي ايطاليا لها علاقه بالتجمعات الكبيره يعني اوت بريك الكبيره اللي صارت في ايطاليا في بدايه الجائحه كان لها علاقه بالمباراه بتاع النهائي بتاع اللي حصلت في بيرغامو اللي هي المكان اللي صار فيه في ايران طبعا كانت الحج بتاع قم وغيرها والامراه اعتقادي الشخصي بالنسبه لي بالمناسبات الاجتماعيه ربما ساهم في نوع من الهيرت اميونيتي مع انها هي ما كانتش التعليق المفروض ما نقولهاش يعني هو المفروض طبعا يكون في تباعد اجتماعي لكن يبدو لي انه حصلت زي نوع من الانتشار سريع الغالبيه العظمى ما يكونش عندهم اعراض لكن قد يكون تفسير قد يكون هذا يعزى ان الفاست ميجورتي من البوبيوليشنز في ليبيا هم يانج يعني ما همش الاذر طبعا طبعا وهذا مضبوط وهذه نقطه جدا مهمه فعلا لان هم دائما يقولوا ايش معنى ايطاليا في البدايه صار فيها كم هائل من الوفيات فيه لان ايطاليا مسميها طبعا اكيد هي الدوله العجوز في اوروبا يعني نسبه الكبار السن فيها اعلى بكثير واحد وبينها وبين اليابان يعني صحيح صحيح فكان كان حتى اليابانيين يقول لك ان عندهم التي بي الفاكسين بتاع التي بي هذا اجباري مش كيف ايطاليا 
فعزوه حتى انه بيواخذ صح صح يطلع يعني طبعا كل مش مش هم حتى العمر في البدايه قالوا لا لان ايطاليا لما طلع الاحصائيات كان التركيز مثلا على الناس اللي هم الحالات الحرجه والسيفير وكذا ما كانش في مقارنه حقيقيه يعني ستاتستيكالي مرات الارقام تكون مضلله دائما يعني ما فيش حاجه هند بالسنت معناها مضبوطه يعني لما تقارن انت مثلا ما حصل في الهند تو بما حصل في امريكا احنا كلنا نقول الهند ما حصل فيها كارثه بكل المقاييس لكن لما تقارنها كنسب سكان ونسب وفيات تقارنها تلقى الوضع في امريكا في الواقع اسوء. بخصوص المرضى اللي يطلبوا كيموثيرابي هل الفاكسين يقدر يعطي عليهم خاصه هم ويفترض ان اي حد ياخذ تطعيم ما فيش حد ممنوع يعني كونترا انديكيتد الا اذا كان حد عنده الرجي كمفهوم عام في استثناءات اذا كان في صاحب الناس اللي هم اميونو كومبرومايز اللي عندهم ياخذ في كيموثيرابي تبي تبي هنا تبي يكون في بالانس حد الدكتور اللي عالج فيه اذا كان هو اميونو كومبرومايز لدرجه انه خاف عليه انه ممكن ياخذ الكوفيد ممكن اجلوه التطعيم لكن اذا كان الى حد ما ستيبل اتس بيتر ان نعطوه التطعيم تو بروتكت هيم هذه تنطبق على الناس حاليا في دراسات على الناس اللي عندهم انفلاماتري باول ديسيزز وايضا في الحالات بتاع الناس بتاع الكيدني ترانسبلانت وغيرها الكيدني ترانسبلانت الاورجان ترانسبلانت بصفه عامه الناس اللي ياخذوا في اميونو سبريسيف تريتمنت في الاول هم اعطوهم التطعيم الجرعه الاولى والجرعه الثانيه في الدراسات الاولى وبعدين ما عادش اعطوهم التطعيم مش لسبب انه خايفين عليهم لكن لسبب انه ما داروش ما, 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 ما طلعوش اجسام مضاده. الان الدراسات الجديده انهم عاد لما اعطوهم الجرعه الثالثه بدا النيوترا بدات الانتي بادز بتاعهم مقاربه للليفل اللي هو في في النورمال بيبل يعني. فما هيش حاجه يعني ما فيش حاجه ممنوعه على فئه معينه لكن فيه قرار ديسيجن تاع المريض عادة ياخذ الطبيب المعالج اكثر شيء. دكتور بس هل في طيب معين من الفاكسين للاميونو كومبرومايز بيشن ولا اي نوع من؟ اه اسفار ذا اي نو ما فيش طبعا انت عارفه دكتور بحكم التخصص انت بتاعك الحاجات اللي هي عارفه الحاجات اللي هنا لايف اتينيويتد فاكسينز والله كذا اللي هنا طبعا فيها الريسك اكيد حيكون اكيد عالي يعني بس ما هو في انواع جديده المسنجر في في اي طبعا 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 يعني دائما المسنجر فيها سلم جيت ذا يومورال فبيعتبروها هي هي سيف فور ذا اميرو كومبرمايز في نفس الوقت كانها لايف اتينيويتد يعني فورتس عندها دول فانكشن سيف سيف وعندها دول سلم جيت ذا يومورال كانها اتينيويتد يعني هايلي هايلي عندها بيرفورمانس عالي نفس التوقيت هي سيف لانها نط اتينيويتد هي مسنجر بس هم مش واخدين لا مقدين الجين اللي صار الجين اللي بيتني بروتين سبايكس دكتور ترى سؤال اللي كنا نحكي عليه ان الفاكسين هذا انه انت تعطي جرعه وقائيه مثلا قبل ما يجيك الكورونا ولا انت عشان ما يجيكش كورونا ولا تيجي لانك ما عملناش لو انت مثلا انت جاك الكورونا هل حناخذه نحن نفس الفاكسين وهل هو يمكن انه يعالجه ولا لا؟ هي واحدة من الحاجات اللي دائما كانت فيه جانب في التوعية مهم جدا شنو الدور نتاع الفاكسين لما طلع في البداية، الدور نتاع انه يحميك ان المرض ما يكونش شديد. يعني حتى الارقام اللي يعطوهم تو يقول لك مثلا هذا فاكسين افكتف مثلا 80% مثلا سبوتنيك قال لك 100% حماية من الوفاة الله اعلم طبعا لكن 80% يعني انه ما يكونش عندك المرض سيفير، لكن هذا لا يعني انك انت ما احمل انه ما يصير لكش الفيروس ممكن طبعا. لو جاني ناقضه مش يعالجني ولا لا؟ لو جاني مرض يعني انا تو اكتف كورونا هل ناقضه اخرى يقدر يعالجني ولا لا؟ لما تاخذ الفاكسين ولا لا بالتاكيد لما تجيني كورونا اها تاخذ طبعا طبعا هي هني وربما تكون في ميزه انك تاخذ افضل انت لما لا قدر الله صبت مثلا بالكوفيد 19 حيتولد عندك الاجسام المضاده والخلايا بتاعت الذاكره والى اخره، لكن لما تاخذ الفاكسين انت بالعكس انت مش تحمي نفسك وبس زياده تحمي حتى الناس اللي معك، كل ما طعمنا اكثر عدد ممكن من الناس كل ما حمينا انفسنا بطريقه غير مباشره. يعني لما تكون انت محمي ومحمي وبالتالي حتى يعني هذا جانب مهم يعني التوعيه للمجتمع لان يعني المفروض نحن نطعم حفاظا على الاخرين مش بس حتى على انفسنا يعني كل ما طعمنا اكثر عدد ممكن في البلاد كل ما حمينا المجتمع بتاعنا وصرنا والى اخره ولا دكتور حاليا حنحكي صراحه الكونكلوجن هو انه الفاكسينز زي ما قال البروفيسور عبد العزيز 
important save معنا برضه البروفيسورز ان ايميونولوجي يعني ادلوا بدلهم بصراحه وافادوا اثروا النقاش هو عباره عن one of the safest vaccine لانه هو يعني مش دي ان اي مش هيغير حاجه هو ار ان اي الار ان اي الديجراديشن سريع للار ان اي وبيدي بروتكتيف اميونيتي باقل يعني باحسن ما يكون على اي حال بروفيسور عبد العزيز نشكره صراحه على سعه صدره انه هو جاوب على اذا كان في اسئله ثانيه اقترح فيها يعني نوت ان اكسبرت في الموضوع بتاع الفاكسينز نحن عندنا فوكال بوينت فيه لكن طبعا هناك دائما ابديتنج ماي نولج عن طريق الدبليو شو لكن إذا كان في أي أسئلة ثانية يمكن عن طريق الدكتور رشاد أو حد ممكن نبعثه إلى مور يعني حد ثاني اللي هو متخصص في هذا الموضوع ويجاوب عليهم، لكن هذه الأسئلة أم 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 شور إن هي هذه الدبليو شو الردود بتاع الدبليو شو على بعض التساؤلات الموجودة، وما تنسوش إن هذا مازال ربما المجهول أكثر من المعلوم في هذا في ال بالذات في ممكن نعمل لينك حتى للكويستشن وينشر في الصفحة بعدها بالضبط أي سؤال إحنا ممكن نستقبل الأسئلة و بالتعاون مع البروف عبد العزيز فنحن يعني نستغل هذه الفرصه ننتهي هذه الفرصه بان احنا نكرم الدكتور عبد العزيز في هذا التقدير و درع الجامعه درع الجامعه الليبيه اللي هي الدرع الرسمي للجامعه وانا طبعا نعطي فيه للناس المتميزين جدا اللي فعلا يعتبروا شركاء حقيقيين في نجاح هذه الجامعه تفضل دكتور عبد العزيز كوفيد 19 بريكوشنز هذه ادارات لنا ريستركشنز في كثير من الاشياء كثير من الاشياء لازم تكون اونلاين واشياء لا وكذا دكتوره خديجه باعتبارها في اللجنه مسيطره على الموضوع وتراقب في كل شيء وتكتب في تقارير فكان في صعوبه جدا في تنفيذ هذا ال... ولولا تعاون الجميع ولولا مشاركه الجميع زي ما قلت في 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 هذا الانجاز ما كان يحدث يعني فكان انا ما بش ما ننساش حد يعني عندنا شركه انجاز حقيقه قامت بدور كبير في انجاز هذه المهمه عندنا شركه الصحاري للنظافه نظافه الجامعه اخذوا على عاتقهم وكانوا يجوا في اوقات غير الاوقات الرسميه وكانوا مهتمين بهذا الموضوع عندنا مشرفين المباني التعليميه حقيقه يعني قاموا بكثير من العمل حول طاولات نسق مش عارف ايش كذا شغل مجهود كبير كل هؤلاء الناس حقيقة نقدم لهم الشكر والتقدير باسمهم جميعا عندنا إدارة الموارد البشرية اللي هي الشؤون الإدارية عندنا أيضا كانوا في الموعد أنا خايف ننسى حد والله عشان يكون قاعد نسجل عندنا طبعا فريق العمل بالكلية بشكل عام دون تخصيص كان كل مشارك في في هذا الموضوع يعني شكر خاص للجنة المشرفة على هذا الموضوع برئاسة أستاذة نهى النعاس وكيل الكلية كان لها دور كبير حقيقة والفريق اللي معها كانوا متميزين في هذا العمل المركز الإعلامي كان متابع للأحداث وكان يوثق في كل هذه الأشياء فلهم من الشكر أيضا أستاذ المخرج المتألق محمد الغناي حقيقة متابع لكثير من الأشياء وتعبوه يعني جماعتنا بشكل جدا كبير وقام بمجهود يشكر عليه يعني ويكرم عليه ما نبيش ننسى مثلا حد دكتور رشاد متولي موضوع من جهه وكل واحد من تركينا لكن انا استسمحكم عذرا اني نبي نكرم شخص يعني تميز هذا العام بهدوء الشخصيه وقوه الشخصيه واداء متميز طول العام الاكاديمي والتزام وشارك معنا في طيلة أيام الأسابيع الماضية بشكل جدا رائع وكان آراءة ممتازة جدا شارك في كثير معنا في استطلاعات رأي وإجراءات أنا نقول أنها أدت إلى أنها تنجز العمل بشكل أفضل بكثير حيوا معايا دكتورة بسمة قطعان
تفضل دكتورة شكرا جزيلا لك هذا جزء بسيط شكرا, 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 شكرا كل عام وانتم بخير اتمنى ان شاء الله عام سعيد وان شاء الله نلتقي العام القادم شكرا جزيلا لكم